Now it is okay. Biju? Sir, yes, sir. Is that you put on your video? Yeah, your video is clear. But here, Rajesh and uh, AKM with two connection, I can see. Rajesh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. I can see two. I mean, you are sitting together, but uh, yeah, now it is. Uh, I can see uh, Ritesh also and you also. I think same system. I think one you have to put it off and you have to put it on one. Hello. Uh, is the screen is visible? My screen? screen yeah, Rajesh, Rajesh, it is okay. Yeah, your screen is okay. Okay. Yeah, you can put it off. Uh. Rajesh, just uh, wait for uh, two minutes, then we'll start. Rajas, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, just wait for two minutes. I'll tell you to start and then let other participants also start. Okay. <laughs> Rajas, you mute yourself. Mute yourself. I think we need to mute that system. Rajas, you mute, mute. I can hear you. Can, mute your... uh, can you can you hear me properly, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh -huh.
Dr. Devajit, you can start, I think, getting late. Start, sir. Uh, Already yeah, late. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, Rajas, you can start. Rajas, unmute yourself, unmute and start. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me? You can just uh, give a response then through chat box. I'm yeah, we, can, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. This is Sarah yeah. has joined already. Uh, yeah. Then you can start. Yes. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, today the presentation, uh, virtual webinar on uh, recirculating aquaculture system for farming of uh, intensive farming of rainbow trout. So with us, uh, I would like to welcome all everybody in this uh, webinar. Uh, with us, we have uh, uh, Deputy Director General. Yeah, ICR, uh, from ICR. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like to initially start with the remark of uh, director to welcome everybody for this program. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Thank you so much. A uh, uh, very good morning to everybody. So uh, at the very outset, uh, I welcome uh, our most respected uh, Dr. J.K. Janasar, uh, Deputy Director General, uh, uh, ICR Fishery Science, ICR New Delhi, for being present and giving his valuable time for this very important webinar, uh, Recirculity Aquaculture System for in the intensive farming of rainbow trout. I also welcome all the participants. We, uh, yesterday, uh, we were expecting almost, uh, almost uh, 700 participant registers, but today, till now, 220 participants have joined. I, we hopefully, they will be joining uh, during the course of uh, webinar. So I also welcome all of our participants from across the country, from uh, Arunachal Pradesh to Jambu and Kashmir, and also the students from students and faculties from 
College of Fisheries and other institutions, as well as uh, from uh, uh, Hills State Fisheries Departments uh, in the country for participating in this very important webinar that is a recirculatory aquaculture system uh, that uh, we have developed in our institute. So I would like to just brief about one to two minutes uh, before I invite our most respected uh, Dr. Zeke Janasar for giving his most valuable comments. So I would like to in, uh, tell something about recirculatory aquaculture system. Uh, this is an unique system we have developed in order to uh, go for intensive rearing of rainbow trout farming in the country. All of us, we are aware that uh, so far the production of rainbow trout in our country is uh, not very high and total production in the country is uh, right now is uh, 1500 uh, um, metric tons. So if you have to, uh, if you have to achieve from 1500 to uh, 10,000 metric ton on also to the tune of 50,000 metric ton in future, uh, then uh, what other things we have to follow? What are the system diversification we need to adopt in order to have a intensive rearing of our rainbow trout uh, by increasing productivity? The only answer should be the recirculatory aquaculture system where we can uh, demonstrate or we can think of culturing rainbow trout almost you know, 40 kg to 50 kg per meter cube area. So that is the basic you know, uh, important parts of you know, uh, culturing rainbow trout in the recirculatory aquaculture system. Another, uh, which is the, uh, enhancing the productivity uh, in compared to our flow through, you know, culture, that is the race waste culture system. Also, there will be very, you know, there will be a crisis of, you know, water. I mean, that uh, say rainbow trout aquaculture system save a lot of water. I can give, I can give a statistics like, you know, you know, if you have to produce one, one kg of rainbow trout in flow through system, which will take two lakh liter of water for production of one kg of, you know, rainbow trout. But if we can, you know, adopt a recirculating aquaculture system, they are only, you know, 1,000 liter is required to produce one kilo of rainbow trout. So another important issue is that the recirculating aquaculture, recirculating aquaculture system will save water. And also it uh, saved the footprint. I mean, it will take, uh, I mean, small amount of, you know, land. And uh, I mean, this is the automatized system. So we have a control. I mean, we have a control of our, our, our sensitive, you know, climatic conditions. So we, there are a lot of advantages of recirculating aquaculture system that we have to adopt in future if we have to think of a, you know, large enhancing production of rainbow trout in the country. But, you know, if we have to adopt rainbow trout farming by the farmers or entrepreneurs, uh, that we have to understand few basic things. It's not a machine that we adopt few, you know, tanks and then we can start the RAS system for rainbow trout farming. We have to, because it is a biological system, we have to really understand the basics and designs and also the science and biology involved it for operating the rain, uh, rainbow trout of farming in, uh, for culturing the rainbow trout farming in the circulatory aquaculture system. So, uh, so far, BCFR have established in the year of 2019 uh, with the kind guidance of our Honorable Deputy Director General, Dr. Zeke Jana Sar. And we established in 2019, and we have done research so far almost two years for under recirculatory aquaculture system. And we are able to demonstrate uh, 40 kg per, you know, 40 kg per meter cube, you know, in a stocking uh, produ production, uh, we have, are able to demonstrate in our uh, recirculatory aquaculture system. And we look forward this model of recirculatory aquaculture system will definitely will be able to demonstrate to the farmer's level uh, in future within a three to four months. I think we, I mean, or within in this uh, in 2021, we'll be able to demonstrate this RAS system for the benefit of the farmers and also large entrepreneurs we can encourage uh, for adopting the recirculatory aquaculture system. Only I'll, uh, I want to, uh, I, I want to say thank you everybody for giving your valuable suggestions. And uh, I would like to just highlight too that our recirculatory aquaculture system model, RAS model, 
will have two different you know, objective. One will be like we, an entrepreneurship model. We are doing experiment and we are doing validation for two different models. One is entrepreneurship model where large entrepreneurs can come forward and establish the RAS, where he can invest almost 20 to 25 lakhs and he can earn uh, a net profit of 6.25 lakhs and that payback period may be four years. So that is one model where, you know, by investing 20 to 25 lakhs, one can produce, you know, 2.5 ton of uh, rainbow trout in a year. So that is an entrepreneurship model we have demonstrated. And then another model we are working on and we are demonstrated, demonstrated is the small farmer model, where a small farmer can invest 1.5 to 2.5 lakhs, and he can produce 250 to 300 kilo of rainbow trout in a small scale, and their net profit will be 190,000 to 1 lakhs. So that uh, return on investment will be two years. So two different models where small marginal farmers can also adopt RAS system in a small scale, and another will be demonstrated uh, in a you know, large entrepreneurs also can adopt. So this is, and uh, we have successfully demonstrated our scientists have uh, worked, and uh, based on the experience we have for last two years, we have, uh, we have, uh, or we have organized this uh, today's uh, training workshop and uh, two lectures will be given uh, on this uh, recirculatory aquaculture system by Dr. Uh, Rajesh M, who has, uh, who, has, uh, who has got a lot of experience on RAS, on basic uh, components and design, how to design and how, what is the you know, engineering validation of recirculatory aquaculture system uh, while we go for uh, production of rainbow trout. And another will be, uh, will be like you know standard operating protocol. Is there a farmer uh, want to like do? I mean, if a farmer want to establish a recycling culture system, what are the standard operating protocol he has to follow? I mean, whether he is able to take risk, whether he is able to manage the entire system, whether he knows the biology, he knows the science, and whether he has got enough you know expertise or enough you know uh, handling all it for operating this, you know, recirculatory aquaculture systems. So two different lectures will be given by Dr. R. A. Rajesh M. and Dr. Biju Sam Kambalam during this, you know, training program for uh, in, in this morning. So with these uh, words, I welcome all of you once again uh, to this very important uh, webinar on the recirculatory aquaculture system that, that we are, you know, doing for the first time. Uh, and I think probably this is the first recirculatory aquaculture system for rainbow trout in our country, in Denmark and Norway, there are you know a lot of development of recirculatory aquaculture system. But in the country, we are not you know progressing so much on this, and uh, we have worked for two years. I think we'll be able to now you know take a gear, and we will be able to now demonstrate to the farmers level in near future. So with this word, I welcome all of you, and most importantly, I welcome our most respected uh, Dr. Zeke Zanasar, Deputy Director General of Fisheries Science from ICR under whose guidance it is possible to establish and we are working for its success. So with this was, I thank you everybody. And now I uh, request uh, Dr. J.K. Janasar to give his most valuable comments and guidance to uh, take forward in this webinar and also the entire system of the circulatory aquaculture system in the country. Thank you, sir. And I welcome Dr. J.K. Janasar. Thank you, Dr. Debajit. Uh, just one minute. Thank you, Dr. Debajit. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Biju, who will be speaker of today. Colleagues uh, from DCFR, farmers and entrepreneurs friends from uh, different parts of the country. First of all, I would like to convey sincere greetings to each one of you from Indian Council of Agriculture Research and my own behalf. Uh, friends, uh, I do not know whether I should be speaking in English or Hindi. Uh, hopefully our speakers would be speaking in both languages. Of course, uh, I do not know how good he is, Dr. Rajesh, in speaking Hindi, but I do understand he must have learned Hindi by now. Uh, uh, friends, uh, uh, but from the chat box, I did not find anybody has requested for speaking in Hindi. That that means uh, 
people, all those who have joined, uh, would like to hear in English. That is what I assume. But if anyone feel that uh, we need to be speaking in Hindi, you can write in chat box so that our speakers uh, can can uh, modulate whatever the way they like. Uh, friends, uh, the very objective of uh, the organizing such webinars, uh, all of you know, uh, since last one year, we have been almost uh, uh, logged at our respective home. We have not been able to visit to the different places like the institutes like ours, uh, where uh, we have been doing on trout farming and so and so for different aspects of cold water aquaculture. Uh, I assume that the, uh, the uh, participants are not only from the cold water region, but also from different parts of the country, thinking that it is a system we are talking, not the space is only important. We are talking the recirculatory aquaculture system. So that means uh, some people are writing that slides are not visible, uh, but uh, friends, we, uh, we do not have any slides. Uh, the actual speakers would be coming after uh, maybe five minutes or so. Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Biju will be sharing slides uh, for you or uh, uh, giving details of the recirculatory aquaculture system. I, I won't take much time, maybe not more than five, uh, five seven minutes. That is what I intend to have. Uh, friends, uh, uh, today all of us know uh, that uh, uh, what is our objective before us, uh, objective before the country, objective before uh, each one of us. Are you able to hear? I'm a Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are getting <clears throat> uh, So production, productivity is one thing the country is looking for. But at the at the individual level, at the farmer's level, uh, at the entrepreneur's level, uh, uh, production and productivity is not that much important. At the end of the day, money is matters. How much income we get, how much profit we get at the end of the day that is more important. Uh, but at the same time, if you don't have production, you don't have in, uh, productivity, you won't get income or profit. So everything is interlinked. <clears throat> then coming to the system, what uh, today topic of discussion uh, uh, is uh, recirculatory aquaculture system. Why? Why should you go for recirculatory aquaculture system? When we know over the years we have been doing farming in our ponds, tanks, maybe here and there in the reservoirs with cages, pens, and so and so forth. Why should we go for a recirculatory aquaculture system? Probably we need to have a very uh, detailed analysis before we go for. We need to have a SWOT analysis. What is that strength, weakness, and opportunity and threat for e this system? before we go for investment. Uh, this is not the new technology we have been talking. Uh, friends, at least 30 years before, when I was a student, a uh, graduate student for undergraduate student in fisheries science, we used to study the high intensive systems like the circulatory aquaculture system, what we have been talking today, 30 years back. We did uh, study on the raceways, flow through systems, all those we used to study. That means last 30 years we have been talking and it is only uh, the subject is being discussed very widely only in last two, three years. Why? What was that difficulty? If the technology was available last 30 years, why people did not adopt it? And there are, there are uh, that is why it is necessary for us to analyze before someone adopt. So I'm sure uh, Dr. Rajas would be giving detail of uh, everything. What is that pros and cons? Uh, so that at the end of uh, uh, maybe one year, two year, somebody should not say that you have not told about this. Like uh, we know when we go for investment, for example, uh, you go for uh, what do you call mutual funds uh, or any other, uh, uh, maybe some, what you call, I do not know, uh, in different company you like to invest. And the paper last, uh, it would be written, uh, it is subject to risk. 
so please uh, read carefully it is subject to risk uh, mark it is subject to the market similarly when you purchase a cigarette packet a small letter or so not small letter in big letter it is written cigarette smoking is injurious to health that means that does not mean we say that you don't invest but you, what is before adopting some technology it is not rs it is not bioflock it is not even cage culture it is for everything every investment we do uh, whether we go for horticulture floriculture or pulp farming anything you like to go you need to understand not only every intricacies of the technology every a b c d of technology but also the advantages disadvantages likely uh, risk you may encounter or uh, what is the troubleshooting if troubleshooting is there how do you manage those manage those every aspect we need to understand uh, but this is a this is a wonderful technology as uh, dr devojit also spoke to in a brief which will be talked uh in a small area you can get a huge amount of uh, fish uh, for example one hectare of uh, pond uh, today for example if somebody is going for carp culture or carp polyculture whatever you say even if very intensive farming you do 15 ton 20 ton maximum like that if you are doing or catfish farming like fungaceous you get uh, somewhere around uh, maybe 30, 25 ton, 30 ton, 40 ton, or so on and so forth. It depends on the species you go for. So people are talking of today, not in hectare, we are talking in cubic meter. That is what is the technology. That is what Dr. Debojit was talking per cubic meter, 40 kilo, 50 kilo, 60 kilo. That is what the uh, advantage of this technology. In a small area, you get a high volume of fish. That means you don't need to have a large land. Many people uh, like to have investment in the, uh, like to do investment in fish farming, but may not have large land. So they look for a technology with limited availability of land. Uh, somebody uh, like to invest. Uh, uh, if somebody want to uh, do investment in fish farming in peri-urban areas or inside cities, even metropolitan cities, somebody want to do, probably it is the technology which is quite feasible, quite feasible. Uh, even in the metro city, uh, city if you have few, uh, maybe uh, 2000 yards of land, uh, why not uh, have an investment? Uh, even crores of investment you can do within a small piece of land. And it is relevant again for the species like trout. Why uh, trout are being farmed in the upland areas, hilly areas where you don't have big areas for definitely pond farm. Uh, even construction of pond, you may not have large areas, all these areas, slopey areas, even the raceways, wherever we construct, even uh, a farm of uh, uh, raceway system, you don't have enough land. So probably that is why we are talking of the technology like RAS in the trout, uh, for the trout farming. And again, it is more relevant for trout because we have been doing people is the last two, three years. Some people have adopted, some entrepreneurs have come, but very few of them probably have become successful in case of RS because it is not the technology has a disadvantage. It is only because the, in case of uh, freshwater farming, for example, in the tropical fishes, carp or pangaea, tilapia and all, those are very low value species. Maximum about uh, maybe 80 rupees, 90 rupees, 100 rupees you get per kg of selling fish. So you don't, because the cost of production becomes very high, because high energy input, you need to have uh, all the time power, electricity for circulation of water, keeping the dissolved oxygen level, making your um, uh, biofilter functional, because uh, all, all those intricacies Dr. Rajesh would be speaking, why do you need to have biofiltration system in place? Uh, for example, when you are talking at high density, uh, all of you know the principle of recirculatory ex aquaculture system, we keep all the water uh, requirement, whatever the quality of water we uh, like to give to the fish, all the time we like to see that the water quality attained. 
water when i uh, talk of water quality it is not only the ph or diesel oxygen it is the, for example the uh, systems like this when you have a high density of fish talk you have uh, the for example ammonia nitrate level would become very high so you need to see that that ammonia level is reduced and uh, uh, made to nit nitrate form which is not toxic even so many of the systems you get uh, in uh, in the recirculatory system at the end of the day the nitrate content becomes even uh, 200 ppm uh, does not matter but what we like to see that ammonia load or nitrate load does not go up, uh, high so the fil filtration system so important and dr debajit was talking of advantages it is not only the space but also for example uh, the water requirement of water so precious probably today we are not uh, that is what I, I was talking 30 years back people thought so much of water available why do i invest so much uh, but today uh, people realize water is not a free commodity and water is not available plenty everywhere uh, good quality water is not uh, available everywhere and this technology will become more relevant as day passed by today whatever is relevant after 10 years it will be more relevant after 20 years it will be still more relevant that is what we assume in the coming days whether water will be available for us for fish culture uh, in the ponds we never know we do not know the water table going down in different places of the country uh, and even the places like people used to, we used to study during our uh, school days cherapunji uh, has a highest rainfall in the country uh, but uh, today i am given to understand the people in the cherapunji does not get water even to drink all the year because it ran goes to down and water is not available for drinking even so it is not that water is a free commodity all the time we will be having so the technology of like this would be of more relevant in the area hilly areas and the species like trout and water where water is so precious and will be more useful in the coming days for example the country like israel uh, most of the technology like RAS, we give example of Israel. Why? Because it is a necessity for them. If they go for low production, less than 25 ton, uh, even pond system, it will not be economically viable. Only when they go for high intensive farming, it will be viable for them because water is so precious. They cannot waste a liter of water. So they like to use or recycle the water all the time for the farming. That is why the technology like this has come from the country like Israel. That is what we try to adopt here. But we need to see that, we need to understand, as I told, we need to know the advantages. We need to, at the same time, we know that, uh, and the places, for example, as I told, it is not only the land requirement, even the places like peri-urban areas, urban areas, uh, you can, where you like to supply the fish in high condition you need not spend money in the for the if you are doing farming in 200 kilometer from uh, from the city of delhi or city of somewhere uh, the transportation cost goes up by the time it reaches the market some fishes will die so the places in the peri urban areas nearby areas you can have investment for the recirculator system and the automation you don't need to have so many number of people even a farm a big uh, farm with maybe 500 ton capacity a um, handful number of people will be able to manage but at the same time the country like ours Probably, probably all of us to be aware that the power is so important. You need to, it is an energy intensive system. 24 seven, you need to have a power. You cannot think of uh, investing in this system where power cut is six hours uh, in summer uh, or power cut is for long period. Uh, every now and then there is a power, uh, power fluctuation. Every six hours, there will be two times power will go you may have the again uh, system like generator and all but all the time it becomes expensive so all those th things need to be taken care of and investment capital investment is so high uh, but 
but the when you are looking for high value species like trout where you intend to sell at 400 or 500 rupees probably it will be quite viable i am sure the economics also dr rajesh would give uh, the pilots what they have done but let me tell you this is also in pilots uh, this is done in pilots if somebody want to have a heavy investment for example i want to have a heavy investment targeting 500 uh, tons capacity uh, for them, I would advise start with a small unit of one or two units with a ca production capacity of maybe uh, 10 ton, 15 ton, 20 ton, not beyond that. Get experience with a one crop, then try to uh, get educated by yourself and try to expand. Uh, because at the end of one year, two years after investment, uh, you should not, again, somebody should not close. Because I know some systems, not for this trout, definitely. I am not scaring you uh, all. But uh, you should, as entrepreneurs, you are investing at the, uh, uh, today you are investing because you are getting uh, maybe uh, loan from the banks are so easy nowadays. Or PMSSY, you have a subsidy component of 40% or so. I do not know how much 40% or so subsidy. That's why you, uh, that, okay, that, that helps to great extent, definitely. But that should not be the main motto to get the uh, subsidy. If you are going for investment, you think for not only one crop, two crop. You take, consider it would be a profession of yours next 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years. If you are looking at a, this one as a profession or a major income source, then it is perfectly. You need to be ambitious, but at the same time, you need to be very as uh, too much of cautious also in your approach. How do you learn first thing? Because today, I am given to understand many people, mainly the new systems like uh, uh, RS, Bioflock, or some of the cage farming people. Some of the people they think that it is a man, money making machine. This is not a money making machine. Let me tell you. It is a farming, any farming, let it be agriculture, horticulture, animal husbandry or fisheries, any farming needs commitment, dedication and knowledge. Today, people think that fish farming does not have any science. Uh, it is a knowledge based farming system. So you need to be all the time at your toes, uh, quite vigilant of the system. And I'm sure if you, uh, if someone uh, is interested to invest, take it as a consider is a uh, likely to, um, uh, you think to this will, you like to have a profession. Uh, I'm sure you will be able to succeed. And the species like trout uh, definitely has a greater advantage because there is no competition. Uh, if somebody is going for carp, uh, pangasius, paku, and or even uh, magur, there will be competition several uh, people are doing. But trout, uh, our country, even if we hundredfold also we increase, still there will be market, not only domestic market, export market with the uh, people's, uh, uh, with, the, with the income level going up, people are trying to have high value spaces like trout. So it will have advantage. But uh, you need to see the market first. Anybody who are uh, trying to do uh, farming of this, try to link with the market, buyback arrangements, all those are possible. Uh, even we are looking much beyond also. Uh, we are looking not only uh, trout farming, we are looking for even land-based salmon farming. That is what is country looking for. Uh, all of you know that salmon is a marine species being farmed in Norway, Chile, and uh, many other countries uh, in the temperate region. Uh, but uh, of late recent years, there has been some effort, land-based salmon farming has become successful. So I'm sure the experience of trout farming in the RS system would pave way for undertaking this program in mass scale in coming years also. So friends, I uh, probably I have taken a little more time than uh, I wanted to take. Uh, so I would uh, uh, like to thank Dr. Devojit for give, giving in the opportunity, Dr. Biju and, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Rajesh. I'm sure that you would be leading this program. 
uh, as I told till now also, I have not got any chat box uh, that someone should be speaking in Hindi. So that means you can go on in English, uh, no issue, as long as there is uh, no request uh, from anyone, any friends. A good number of people, now I see about 284 people have joined. Hopefully, uh, no more people are joining. Uh, this is good number also. Yeah, I assume if 1% of them, if 1% of them that means 2.1% means 2.8, the RA uh, as a commercial level, you are successful. Because technology like this, we don't expect to be adopting. If at the end of one year, if three owners are created, uh, Rajesh and Baiju, to have as many as 300 people uh, for this program and uh, get sincere greetings and, uh, 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 and I wish all the best for successful program. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I would not be able to stay for long because I have to join in another program, another training program organized by NBFGR. Uh, now uh, it is going on. So I will be joining then some, several other issues. So thank you very much. Congratulations and best wishes. Greetings to each one of you participant friends. Thank you very much for joining. And uh, not only DCFR, all of our ICR institutes are con series of program uh, nowadays through webinar but we are also simultaneously uh, so thank you very much and uh, wish you all the best thank you so much thank you thank you so much sir for your uh, kind words and uh, valuable words as you rightly said like you know this uh, technology of RAIs will be very useful for the farmers and also large scale entrepreneurs. And even this technology, the knowledge of RAIs not, may not be applicable only for research, uh, rainbow trout farming. Uh, it may be applicable same way for all other high value fishes, for all other important fishes, even warm water fisher also principle and uh, all the protocols will be same. So I thank you very much. And we look forward to even the work on land-based uh, small mound farming based on the experience and uh, exposure we get uh, out of the, our areas, you know, uh, experimentation and ROS, ROS intensive farming for rainbow trout system. So I thank you very much for your sir, kind presence and more valuable guidance. And now I request uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh to uh, start the presentation. Uh, the first presentation, basic components and design of recirculating aquaculture system. Dr. Rajesh. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, okay. Yeah, uh, once again, welcome uh, all the participants. I am audible to everyone. Can uh, can and uh, everybody is able to see my screen. Yeah, Rajesh, yeah, audible, audible. Uh, participants, they can just. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I hope uh, everybody will be able to see my uh, screen now. So both uh, DDG and director they had put uh, uh, the remarks uh, correctly because um, what I intended to speak, they have given a very good introduction for that. So um, in this seminar, we have uh, divided in, uh, this into two topics. Basically, one is um, RA system, basics and component and design. In this uh, presentation, we'll be covering what exactly RA is, how, where it comes, like uh, its importance, and how we can design it. And uh, mainly, yes, ultimately, as uh, DDG mentioned, it uh, comes down to money. 
whether one can make money from this system uh, because most of the participants um, definitely will be looking forward to this to this and uh, uh, why this particular topic is now because um, both government of india and lot of uh, from the number of participants currently uh, almost 300 it is uh, very sure that this topic is very relevant at the current scenario and even indian uh, government also almost uh, emphasizing on um, many of the modern technologies ras it might be biflock or iprs all uh, they are inputting um, giving lot of inputs and supports for improving the fish production in the second seminar uh, will be done by dr biju uh, he will be covering the risk, uh, risk management aspect and what are the problems will be faced uh, in RAS uh, when, while you farm fishes in RAS and how we can overcome. These are the aspects he will cover. So myself, uh, Dr. Rajesh, uh, scientist working as um, scientist in uh, fish nutrition, basically. Uh, from the last three few years, uh, we started uh, recirculating aquaculture system, uh, which uh, uh, we developed in a pilot scale unit. Um, uh, from the last two, year ex, uh, two years, we are culturing fishes in that. And we'll be sharing our experience from that, as well as uh, from the many published uh, re uh, research and uh, the commercial um, outcomes from different parts of the world on rainbow trout farming, as well as uh, in other fishes. So the contest of rainbow trout farming, I mean, recirculating aquaculture system comes from majorly, basically because of the water usage. Uh, if you look into the water usage of our daily day-to-day -day stuffs, starting from meat, you can see that uh, meats require more than 5,000 liters of water uh, per kg production. If rice, it is 2,500 liter per kg of rice to produce. And what about fish? So if the fish water is not used up directly, but it is um, ultimately required for growing fishes because it might be, there will be, might be loss in evaporation loss or in case of flow through system, there is a flow through water has to enter one way and an exit from another way. So ultimately we require water. So we can divide this into two uh, phases, mainly uh, cold water and warm water. If you look into the cold water, which mostly, for example, rainbow trout, which is cultured in race fish. Water requirement, if you see, it is 3,75,000 per kg of fish. It's a huge amount of water. To produce one kg of fish, there's almost 3.75 lakh liter of water. However, we can reduce the water usage by serial reuse, partial reuse. And if you come to complete a recirculating unit, uh, aquaculture system, we can reduce it to just 3,000 or less than 3,000 liter per kg. That is the reduction of almost uh, 100 times. And if you look into the effluent also, the effluent, you can clearly see that uh, in a single pass or raceway, the dilute effluent, very difficult to treat. And whereas full uh, in a recirculating system is a concentrated effluent, very easy to treat. In the warm water fish also, the same scenario, you can see uh, uh, in raceways, mostly, uh, some of the warm water fishes like um, common carp and cultured in uh, raceways in some of the countries, uh, there you can see almost 33,000 liter of, to produce one kg of fish. And in a pond system, it is 1,800 per kg. Uh, whereas in fully recirculating warm water, it is just 100 liter per kg of fish. That's a huge, huge uh, differences. That's uh, the strength of this technology. Um, if you look in Indian scenario, you the carp farming, uh, which average production of four to ten ton per hectare, uh, the maximum stocking density um, is 0.4 to 1 kg per meter cube only achieved. In as uh, DDG was telling, we talk uh, productivity in terms of kg per meter cube in RAS, whereas in uh, the pond system we talk in tons per hectare. So. Even with the high intensity production systems in ponds, maximum achieved uh, production is 40, 40 to 70 tons per hectare. That's hardly four to seven kg per meter cube. But in RAS, we can go 80 to 120 kg per meter cube. That's a uh, huge numbers, which uh, makes us uh, interest in this particular technology. Now, specifically, if you go to rainbow trout, how much water is required to produce a kg of fish? Uh, 
the standards suggest that uh, to maintain uh, like one ton of fish in a, or to grow a one ton of fish in a raceway uh, at a stocking density of 25 to 30 kg, we require somewhere around 600 liter per minute, that much amount of water flow continuously. So it, it amounts for almost one lakh to two lakh liter uh, per kg of fish rainbow trout produced. This range is because of uh, different times, uh, kind of uh, production system. It can be reused, a uh, serial reuse, or single uh, re, uh, use uh, flow through systems. So this makes um, rainbow trout farming only located for where the cold, abundant waters are available of Himachal and Jammu Kashmir, and as well as in some of the Northeast areas. So what is the solution for this is yes, the recent advances in RAS uh, definitely reduced uh, the water flow rates by many folds. As I said, it is 0.12, just 0.12, uh, two meter cube of water to produce a kg of fish. Very powerful technology. Let us look what is exactly RAS is. RAS is, if you to define, it's uh, essentially a technology which uh, uh, intended to provide a proper water quality for the fish, uh, the, where fishes can grow maximum by reusing the water through a various level of filtration. It can be mechanical, biological, and very uh, other <clears throat> other disinfection process. So, te technically or theoretically, you can grow any any uh, species in this fish if you know the. Um, the water quality requirement for that particular candidate species. Uh, you can grow from shrimp to salmon, salmon to tuna, sturgeon, but each uh, species uh, will have different requirement, both water quality as well as the system requirement will be different. Uh, for example, uh, particularly prawn. Prawn, the maximum stocking density achieved is uh, 20 kg per meter cube. Why? Because uh, they occupy the floor space rather than the water column. Unlike fish, like for rainbow trout or tilapia, which can we can maintain a stocking density of 150 kg per meter cube because they can occupy the column of water. And uh, the major advantage of uh, RAS is yes, the water. That is one aspect. The water usage is 100 times less, and the land required for is many many folds less. And the other advantage is that the production um, efficiency. Rainbow trout can be, from our experience, rainbow trout can be grown in from uh, egg to one kg size in within a one year in RAS, while same takes more than uh, two years in case of uh, flow through systems. Feed efficiency is better. One of the interesting point is that now only rainbow trout farming is happening in Himachal and Jammu Kashmir, only the northern part of the country where the temperature and uh, waters are plentifully available. But recently, to give an example, uh, in Hyderabad, uh, rainbow trout RAS culture has been initiated. So this is the power of technology. We can bring any farming, uh, farming of any kind of fish towards the near the marketplace where their demand is there. And we can provide fishes, uh, produce fishes throughout the year. So let's look what are the water quality required for uh, <clears throat> uh, for the different uh, kind of species, mostly I classified into cold water and warm water fishes. If you look into the alkalinity, that is one of the major parameter that's 500 to 50 to 300, that is a uh, suitable one. In case of ammonia, ammonia is a significant uh, in a deciding parameter, one of the parameter where free ammonia sh shouldn't be more than 0 0.01, uh, while in case of tan, tan is nothing but total ammonia nitrogen, which represents both ammonia and ionized ammonia. Uh, that should be should not be more than one in case of cold water, uh, RAS, and in case of warm, we can go up to three, but not more than three. Uh, in case of uh, dissolved oxygen, uh, always we should be trying to maintain above 80% saturation. Um, uh, roughly to say, uh, in rainbow trout case, it should be always about 8 ppm. Uh, carbon dioxide is uh, another parameter uh, which uh, should not be more than 20 ppm for rainbow trout, while it can be up to 60 ppm for tilapia. So these are the parameters which helps us to decide 
uh, and design the system according to the requirement of the species, how sophisticated it should be or it should not be. Uh, whereas the nitrite, uh, it should not be more than 0.5. And if it is a soft water, the levels, the toxic level will become much reduced, uh, much uh, lower uh, toxic levels can be seen around 0.1 ppm. It should not be more than 0.1 in case of soft water. Uh, the end product of biological nitrification, for example, nitrite, it is uh, zero to 400, it can go up to 400. Uh, in case of uh, ozone, ozone is used for disinfection. Their uh, level should be in PPP, high PP, uh, PPP level. pH should be acidic range. Uh, society, we interested in acidic range. Why? Because uh, it reduces the, uh, the toxicity due to the ammonia, the free ionized ammonia. Ionized ammonia, fa fa uh, fraction of ionized ammonia will be more towards the acidic side. So the better range is, it should be seven to eight is the best range for the uh, RAS fishes. And other parameters are total suspended solids. You can see for rainbow trout, it should not be more than 20 ppm. While in case of, it can be slightly higher for up to 80 in case of tilapia. Um, hardness is around 100 ppm, should be more than 100 ppm. And the temperature is another major parameter. It is very much species specific. For example, for trout, the optimum range for growth is 12 to 18 degree. And specifically too, if you are able to maintain a specific temperature, it is 14 to 16 degrees are the best temperature for growing rainbow trout. Um, for Atlantic salmon, it is 15 degrees centigrade, while common carp, it is 25 to 30, and tilapia and fungaceous IMC, somewhere between 28 to 32 degrees. And for even for the catfishes, Indians, many of the catfishes. So these are the parameters we'll be considering before designing uh, any systems. So our system, uh, these will be design targets. So we re uh, try to reach these parameters through various level of filtrations. So before um, designing, we should understand that what are the things goes into the uh, fish rearing or uh, fish to grow a fish and what are the waste comes out. This is called mass balance. Basically, this is an engineering concept used for to design any, any um, uh, like uh, especially for recirculating aquaculture system, what goes in and what comes out. That's uh, important to understand. So the major factor, uh, suppose we want fish. To, to grow the fish, of course, we need to feed, the feed, um, feed them with a uh, good amount of feed. So if you give one kg of feed, suppose to trout, only 65 to 70 percent of the feed is digested, and rest 300 gram uh, is comes out of the thesis. And uh, to metabolize one kg of feed, they require around 0 0.5, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 kg of oxygen. And you can look into the oxygen demand uh, requirement of a rainbow trout, which is differ with the temperature as well as uh, the size. And so. It's some at 15 degree, you can see the requirement is somewhere around 400 to 200 mg uh, oxygen per kg per hour. That's the requirement. So rainbow trout require more oxygen. It can for tilapia and other fishes, it can be much less. So, so metabolize both for catabolism and uh, anabolism and the fish to accrete the muscle. They during the process, they convert this feed into their muscle protein. So during that, Ammonia is generated for every kg of feed, 40 to uh, with a, a protein percentage of roughly 40 to 45, um, 40 to 45 gram of ammonia is released. That can be simply calculated uh, with a soft number. Let's say tan is, is equal to protein concentration into um, n percentage or into 0.1. So that will give you an, a soft uh, value for the ammonia product produced from every kg of feed you put into the system. So and another uh, uh, effluent which generates is carbon dioxide. That is uh, for every kg of uh, feed, almost um, 0.35 to 0.56 kg of carbon dioxide is generated. So what we understand here is to grow the fish, we need feed. And what are the things to be added in the system is feed and oxygen. That is uh, for every kg, it is 0.3 to 0.5. And what has to be removed is ammonia uh, because they are toxic at uh, very low level and fecal solids because we cannot allow a lot of solid to accumulate and as well as carbon dioxide. So 
using these mass balance um, formula or the, the equations, we design our systems. Uh, before that, uh, first of the thing is uh, to culture a fish, we need uh, a tank or uh, the contain the water uh, or where which water will be medium for growing the fish. So the, the most, uh, most part of the cost uh, in any RAS is due to their tanks. And the cost of the tank is mostly 20 to 30 percent can be even higher um, depending on the material used. So most of the materials, there are a number of um, choices available for choosing the material of uh, the tanks starting from molded polyethylene, which are very low cost and may not be suitable for large tanks, but they are uh, very much good for uh, small, uh, adhering of small fishes initially for nursery fees. Uh, the second option is fiberglass tanks. These are very um, durable and it can be made into any sizes and any shapes. And uh, and um, they of course they are uh, slightly expensive as well. The second option is cheaper option is galvanized or tin sheet covered with the HDP <coughs> uh, polythene uh, sheets. Uh, these are our, uh, mostly in Indian context. Most of the uh, farmers are using this. Another option is concrete. These are permanent structures. And one has to take care of during curing, especially uh, to avoid the rise in pH. So proper curing has to be done for a concrete tanks. Uh, recently, stainless steel tanks also being used for um, the, this purpose for culturing fishes. So the next uh, question is, what should be the shape of the tank? Uh, should it be round or square or uh, rectangular? Yeah, the criteria for choosing the tank is mostly it should uh, give a promote uniform mixing and very quick removal of solids. Uh, these are the major criteria uh, because uh, uniform mixing is required for supplying oxygen uh, and removing flushing out the ammonia equally for all the fishes. So the, there should be a uniform flow inside the tank. Uh, mostly for that, that's why the most preferred shape of the tank is circular. Uh, or octagonal tanks. Octagonal tanks are better in because they are space efficient. When you are going for a circular tank, there will be loss of space. space. Uh, octagonal tank, it's somewhere between circular and uh, um, the square or rectangular tank. So most commercial uh, systems use circular or octagonal tanks. Uh, there is, a, uh, is there any particular uh, you know, specification for depth and the diameter? For a proper uh, solid removal and mixing, uh, uh, it is suggested that the diameter, depth to diameter ratio should be three to one to, it should be more than three and less than 10 for uh, depth to diameter ratio. Uh, suppose in case of, if the diameter is three, uh, the depth should be one. Uh, such a ratio should be followed to, uh, it's not like that you make a very deep silo tanks where you cannot um, see the dead fishes uh, and fecal matter is not easily removed. So it should be sufficiently, uh, sufficient depth to, uh, diameter to depth ratio should be given. And the next question, what should be the size of my tanks? Whether it should be large or small? Okay, the large tanks are better in terms of cost because as you increase the size of the tank, your cost will reduce uh, per liter of uh, every tank. And that's why, and even for the management aspects, the larger tanks are good. So large means what extent it should be large. Somewhere between like a tank size of 50 meter cube to 300 meter are generally being used uh, in commercial systems. So this size should be very much uh, good. As the larger the size, uh, we, should be we should have the harvesting structures for easily harvesting the fishes from the tanks. Next comes after the tank is to uh, once the fishes are there, once they are feed, next comes the fecal matter to be removed. The fecal matter should be removed uh, mainly because they uh, damage the gill. Um, and the major thing is they, if you're allowed to not remove properly, uh, they clog the plumbing material uh, and uh, they will cause us overflow. The second thing is that um, to improve the efficiency of biofilter, because biofiltration is a chemoautotropic process. If you allow a lot of carbon to go inside, 
they turn from the chemoautotropic uh, pathway to heterotropic pathway, uh, the bi total bio uh, biofuel efficiency will reduce. Similarly, the disinfection process, the UV light, if the water has a lot of solid and it, uh, if it don't have sufficient clarity, the disinfection process efficiency will reduce a great extent. The second thing is, if you are accumulating solid in some of the place, it will result in uh, anoxic conditions, uh, which will be responsible for production of hydrogen sulfide and many uh, off flavor compounds like geosmine or MIB, uh, which will result in um, off flavor in cultured fishes, uh, which will reduce the demand for the fish. So, in the, and mainly thing is that when the visibility is not there because of the, the brown coloration of uh, water, if you don't remove the solid, the fish cannot recognize the feet. These are the, that's why we need to remove solids. The solids are majorly generated because of uh, fecal matter, uneaten feet, uh, dead fish, bacterial films. Um, they can be classified into three ways, uh, settleable solids, suspended solids, and fine dissolved solids. This uh, based on their settleability as well as their size. So most, mostly settleable solids and suspended solids are uh, more major concern. Of course, fine and dissolved solids should also be removed from a very high stocking density um, intensive system. Okay. The first and major thing uh, before stocking, uh, I mean, before uh, in a solid removing system is the tank, the shape of the tank, as I explained, and the dimension of the tank. So the round tanks, as uh, it gives a tick of e effect, we can concentrate most of the uh, solids at the central drain due to the centrifugal action of the water flow. And uh, that's why uh, most of the um, commercial setup, they use dual drain system. Dual drain system means the water is drained from the tank in two ways. It might be side, um, it's a side drain or bottom drain. In this case, suppose, since the most of the solids are concentrated at the center, the 10% uh, the of the uh, water is drained only from the uh, center. And these are made to, and rest 80% of uh, is drained from the top, top drain. So that these 20%, since the volume is less, it will be easier to treat uh, the solid because it can be easily settled. Since the flow rate, the velocity of water is very less, it can be easily settled. So, uh, in this way, we can avoid uh, having la large settling tanks by, uh, because the flow is less, we can uh, um, use swill separators or radial flow settlers, which are nothing but cylindroconical uh, uh, tanks, uh, which allows reduce the velocity of water and most of the solids can be settled. And just by flushing, the capacity of these uh, swill separators is not more than uh, 200 to 500 liter, and it can be easily flushed The second option for is the eco trap. Eco trap um, is uh, given uh, supplied by Pentar Ecosystem and even some other companies. So it can be also easily designed. Um, eco trap is nothing but uh, it has um, most of the uh, I mean fifty percent of the solid generated can be collected in only five percent of the tank flow uh, from a centrally integrated drain. So EcoTrap uh, moves the solid from the drain as shown in the picture. It moves the solid from uh, the center. Battery is running low. Um, from the center, <coughs> center uh, to a swirl separator or a, a solid collecting unit uh, as shown in the picture here in the center. Uh, in this, uh, this can be 50 to 100 liter uh, small collecting unit. Thus, uh, we, we can observe, advantage of this is we can observe the feed waste stage and adjust the feeding rate accordingly, thereby increasing the efficiency of feeding. Then after uh, removing all the settleable solids, uh, it's, uh, the job is to do, remove the most of the uh, suspended solids. Uh, suspended solids uh, uh, are uh, mostly in the size, it can be anything about 200 to above micron, uh, 200 and below micron. So mostly removed by uh, sort of screen filters. Screen filters are nothing but uh, stainless steel mesh 
of rated microns from starting from 30 to 60 micron. And these are uh, can be used as a, um, suppose in case of drum filter, they are uh, the frame of uh, the stainless steel meshes are made into a drum form, a rotating drum form where the water is made to pass through inside a inside the drum and filtering the water, which removes almost 50 micron, anything particles above 50 micron. The choice of uh, mesh for drum filter is uh, the best uh, size is 50 micron because uh, the studies found that less than 50 micron mesh is not, no, it's nowhere beneficial because they are not removing any more solids when you reduce into 30 or 20 micron. Rather, they increase the backwash um, frequency as well as the wastage of water. So these rotating drums are can be made automatic because uh, when the water is passed through these drum filters, they get clogged. Uh, they filter the most of the solids and over the period they get clogged. So when they clogged, the water level rises. Uh, water level rises <clears throat> and in this way, when the water level rises, there are um, you know, the flow level controllers which switches the drum filter to rotate and spray the jet of water which removes the, the settled uh, or the trapped solid from the drum. In this way, this system can be automated and most commercial systems are using drum filter. Drum filters are uh, earlier it used to be very costly equipment because they are used to be imported mostly. Now, many of the Indian manufacturers are manufacturing these drum filters and it is available quite cheaply. The, the third thing is to remove the um, dissolved solids. Uh, dissolved solids can be removed mostly by um, foam fractionator or protein skimmer, uh, which removes practically less than 30 micron. So these are efficient seawater. Recently, freshwater foam fractions are available with the uh, ozone injections, but in fresh waters with a low stocking density, this is not required. Um, but if you are you, for high stocking density, we need to inject with ozone to increase increase the the bubbling and uh, bubbling efficiency. Okay, next comes to the how to remove the uh, because we are feeding. We know that uh, from a kg of feed, uh, 40 gram of ammonia is generated. So these ammonias are very toxic. They are mostly excreted through gills. And um, once, once they excrete into water, they, they are exist in two forms. One is phi ammonia, another is ionized form. That they, once they excrete, depending on the pH and temperature, they get ionized. Or they will have been ammonia form, free ammonia form. So mostly free ammonia form is toxic. Uh, it's level 0 0.02 ppm level less than, uh, more than that is, is very toxic. And why only free ammonia is toxic is because they cannot, uh, only free ammonia can get inside the gill. Ionized ammonia cannot get in fact to the gill. That's why they are not uh, toxic. So while we measure ammonia, most of the kits, uh, the chem, uh, based on the wet chemistry based methods or even probes, they measure total ammonia nitrogen, which consists both free ammonia and ionized ammonia. So, these fraction, as I said, they um, that depends on the pH and temperature. These fractions. So lower the pH, more the free uh, ionized ammonia. Uh, higher the pH, more the free ammonia. So higher the pH means toxicity ammonia is high. And similarly, in the case of temperature. So allow tan in recirculating system for cold water is one ppm. That means up to one ppm. If you find ammonia, you no need to worry. But above 1 ppm, then you have to uh, exactly, there is a problem with your systems. Either those uh, problems um, will be, what are the problem, what are the reasons for elevated level of RAS will be covered uh, in the next presentation. And similarly, allowed nitrite is 0.2 ppm. Up to 0.2 ppm, you no need to worry. There is no issue because they can be, they can tolerate very much, but then above 0.2 or 0.5 ppm, uh, there is a problem with the system. While the last end product of uh, biofiltration is nitrate, uh, which is not toxic even up to 100 ppm or more, uh, but then uh, the aim should be there to 
control it within 100 ppm. So the, because there are some studies suggest that very, more than 100 ppm affects the feed intake. So biological nitrification is nothing but uh, uh, utilization of uh, autotrophic nitrifying bacteria for uh, converting this ammonia to nitrate. So basically, this uh, ammonia is converted in a two-step process. And even in one-step process as well, uh, most of the ammonia oxidizing bacteria uh, catabolize unionized ammonia to nitrite. Uh, most of the bacteria, there are a number of bacteria. It can be nitrosomonas, nitrospira, um, nitrosobolus. Um, this, uh, but in our research, we found that um, in cold water uh, biofilter, we find only nitrospira and nitrosomonas. Especially nitrospira is the major, most of the major bacteria, which is uh, playing a role of um, bioremediation. Similarly, nitrate oxidizing bacteria oxidize nitrite to nitrate, and uh, bacteria mostly involved is nitrospira. So overall, uh, the formula, if you look into the, the chemistry of it, ammonia is converted into uh, nitrate. During the process, they require oxygen, a bicarbonate ion, and uh, they also require amino acids. Uh, I mean, they generate amino acids. So what we can understand from this equation is that they require oxygen and bicarbonate ion, and they produce nitrate and carbon dioxide. So basically, uh, this biofiltration or um, biological filtration is uh, conversion of ammonia to nitrate is acidification process due to the fact that they release uh, free ammonia, uh, sorry, free hydrogen ion as well as carbon dioxide and they consume bicarbonate. This is the factor most of the people uh, do not uh, try to understand that. Uh, the major thing is if you look into that for a if you the stoichiometry, if you look into that, for every gram of ammonia nitrogen converted to nitrate nitrogen, there is four gram of uh, dissolved oxygen is required. That means the biofiltration requires oxygen. And the second thing is that they, they consume seven gram of alkalinity in the process. And they also generate carbon dioxide. So one has to understand that you when you are um, starting an RAS, you will see there is a drop in alkalinity over the period of uh, culture duration. This is mainly because these bacteria are consuming alkalinity. So it will be, a, it can come as low as 10. So when it comes to 10 or 20 ppm, uh, you might be seeing there is a spike in ammonia and nitrite. It is because the reduced availability of carbon source for the bacteria. That's why um, in RAS, we should always maintain above 100 ppm. The alkanate should be above 100 ppm. Uh, this can be done uh, with the addition of uh, um, chemicals containing hydroxides, carbonates, or bicarbonate ion. Uh, to, to make the uh, problem simple, as a thumb rule, for every kg of feed you feed, approximately 0.25 kg of sodium bicarbonate need to be added into the water to meet up the lost alkalinity, uh, which is consumed during the nitrification. Uh, this is very important to maintain pH and, um, to, and maintain a healthy level of alkalinity. And this is especially very much required when you are uh, al the source water, uh, which can be a bore. Mostly a bore is a suitable source water, which has, uh, if the alkalinity is very high, it's very nice. Um, if it is less than 100, then definitely we need to do this regularly. So what is this biological filtration? The biological filtration is nothing but we are giving a surface area, housing material for growth of bacteria. That means uh, any unit, we are increasing the surface of the media uh, through mini winds. There are many kinds of uh, technology on biofilter is available in the, currently in the market. It can be a bead filter where plastic beads, instead of a sand, the beads are used which increases the surface area, as well as this system, bead filter also removes uh, solids for a certain extent. Rot rotating biological contractor uh, is a rotating corrugated um, uh, steel plates or uh, 
uh, HDP plates, which are uh, rotating in the water, half submerged and a half exposed to environment, uh, which um, since they are exposed to air, the oxygen requirement can be reduced uh, significantly. But uh, these are the, and the, another this moving bed biofilter, where K1 media or K5 media, these plastic media, which you see in the screen are used and they are kept in suspension through the aeration. So they maintain a healthy um, uh, growth of bacteria, uh, always uh, maintain a young uh, bacterial profile, thus uh, removing the ammonia to nitrate. Other kind of biofilters like trickling biofilter or even gravels can be used but the problem with the gravels is uh, they get clogged and repeated cleaning is required. The other kind of uh, biological filter uh, is used fluidized sand filter. This is mostly suitable for cold water uh, fishes because sand provides, because in cold water what happens is that the nitrification rate is much lesser compared to the warm water because of the slower growth rate and slower conversion of ammonia to nitrite. That's why we have to increase the surface area significantly. Sand provides uh, a unique uh, property that it has, uh, it provides a, so a very good surface area uh, for the uh, growth of bacteria. That's why sand is used in most of the cold water uh, also. So where the sands are kept in fluidized motion, the velocity of water, the, sp uh, the speed of water is maintained in such a way that it has only to keep uh, uh, the sand fluidized over the period of what happens is the bacteria will grow over the sand and they become more light and light and they go up into the top of the biofilter and regularly we need to harvest the top layer of the uh, sand otherwise they will move into the your uh, next level of filtration and add new sand but uh, this fluidized sand can be made uh, is very compact a small volume can uh, treat a lot of uh, ammonia Uh, another uh, biofilter is um, provided by the Israeli company, this Bioefficiency, which uses uh, uh, beads uh, or styrofoam beads as a, plastic, uh, as a media for uh, uh, bacterial growth. This uh, filtration system also provides um, degassing because the water is sprayed and uh, blower is blown. In this way, degassing also is done in the system. So once you buy a biofilter and start working with that or uh, set up an RAS and uh, whether the biofilter is immediately functional. Uh, that question, they are not functional immediately. Why? Because uh, there will be no sufficient growth or the, the system is not matured enough. So you might see initial days there will be a spike of tan, nitrate and nitrate. So uh, that's, this can be addressed by fishless cycle. Uh, where we can add ammonia and nitrate into the water and observe the, uh, their uh, peaks. So when you add ammonia on a regular basis, you can see the first peak will be the ammonia peak and the second peak will be the nitrite peak and the third peak is the nitrate. So in around 35 days, uh, the peak uh, starts reducing towards zero, the nitrate peak. That is the time where we can stock fish in fact. Or else we can also do one thing is we can inoculate the nitrifying bacteria uh, into the system. Uh, next uh, system is aeration or oxygen, supplying oxygen to the system as uh, this is one of the important factor for, uh, because which decide the stocking density of uh, uh, the, inter uh, the production capacity of your system. So fish requires oxygen for respiration. Every kg of uh, feed consumes 0.3 to 0.5 kg of oxygen. And uh, DO in, for example, in gold water sector, it should be maintained about 8 ppm, about 80% saturation all the time. Um, even nitrifying bacteria requires biofilter, which we saw exactly in the previous slides. So in total, we can say that uh, in a soft number, one kg of uh, oxygen is required per kg of feed. Um, the minimum value set for dissolved oxygen can be very much species dependent. Suppose uh, tilapia can survive in very low D levels like 4 ppm, but uh, that P, uh, level of oxygen would kill uh, salmonids in minutes. So 
that has to be understood properly. So the system which is uh, used for one fish cannot, maybe or cannot be used for another fish. First, we need to understand what is the requirement of uh, fish for their proper growth. Then only we should start uh, designing a system or uh, uh, trying to culture a fish. Yeah, DO is uh, one of the first factor. If something fish dies immediately, uh, due to some reason, it would be the dissolved oxygen level. If there is a mass mortality immediately, there would be a dissolved oxygen in, in the case of RAS. So simple aeration, which is nothing but uh, supplying uh, environment oxygen, atmospheric air into water. Uh, the atmospheric air has uh, only 21% of oxygen and rest 70% is nitrogen and other gases. So you can imagine, and the efficiency of uh, aeration is only 5%. When we diffuse through air stone or air oxy tubes, or diffuser plates. And thus, we can only achieve saturation. Uh, that's 100% saturation only. That allows us to maximum 40 kg fish per meter cube biomass only. So aeration will not, uh, at least in rainbow trout, uh, this is the only uh, biomass we can achieve uh, through aeration. One of the advantage with the aeration is that uh, there won't be any buildup of carbon dioxide because during the process of aeration, it will be stripped up. So there are a variety of um, uh, aerators are available, ring blowers, root blowers, and diaphragm blowers. To improve the stocking density and uh, intensification, pure oxygen is must. And uh, with the pure oxygen injection, we can increase the stocking density from 40 to 120 kg per meter cube, at least three times increment in oxygen level. So oxygen can be supplied from compressed pure oxygen or liquid oxygen or uh, uh, in-house oxygen generator. Probably in-house oxygen generator will be the better option in Indian scenario. And these are not supplied through a stone or diffuser, but rather through a oxygen cone or low head oxygenator. Why? Because oxygen is costly and aeration is only 5% efficient. The a stones diffuser what we use. That's why these oxygen cones are low head oxygenators, which um, improves the transfer or gas transfer efficiency to nearly 90 percentage. That's why we are not wasting a lot of oxygen. The, the so another technology, recent technology available is nano bubble um, oxygen. Uh, these are the recent technology and uh, nano bubble is, has a different property compared to the normal macro bubble. Uh, uh, because the nano bubbles do not rise to the column, unlike macro or micro bubble. Um, and they, that's why their resident time is 12 to 30 days. Oxygen, oxygen concentration can be increased up to 60 ppm in, in uh, using this nano bubble. Um, and there are a lot of evidences suggest that the growth rates of fishes and plants, even plants in aquaponic system, uh, significantly increases when compared to normal aeration and nano bubble uh, oxygenation or the other uh, method of oxygenation because these nano bubbles um, have a sanitizing effect they can uh, reduce the pathogenic microorganisms as well and they, they have a high very high oxygen efficient 60 to 85 percentage once all the filtration is done, when the water is filtered back to the culture tank, before that, uh, there's a possibility that we, there's a load of more load of pathogenic and other heterotopic unwanted bacteria, which need to be removed because otherwise they will act as a, a carrier for um, infection as well as they require oxygen uh, oxygen demand. So best um, two of the way uh, uh, waters are disinfected. One is ozone treatment and UV treatment. Ozone is very strong oxidizing agent, which is highly toxic to all forms of life as well, uh, because anything comes in contact with oxidizes. Most of the organic matter, it will be uh, oxidizes, which is uh, very unstable. Uh, their resident time is only 50 minutes. Thus, definitely uh, ozone on-site ozone generator is required. And the important factor is ozone also should be removed from the water before it uh, enters uh, into the culture tank. This can be uh, controlled by ORP meters, uh, oxidative reduction potentials. Uh, 
um, as well as um, when you pass the ozonated water through UV filter, the, all, all the ozone will be oxidized to oxygen. Uh, ozone has uh, another advantage uh, by uh, it improves the water clarity and reduces ammonia and nitrate load as well and BOD and biofilm on the surface of the tanks and uh, uh, plumbing material. Ozone dose uh, less than 300 millivolt is ideal for freshwater RAs. That is the dose uh, um, suitable for freshwater RAs. So here in this picture, you can clearly see the effect of ozonization of water. See, the ozonated water has uh, in rainbow trout culture, when weaved through the weaving window, uh, you can clearly see the, the clarity of the ozonated um, water and the no ozone, the brownish color. Thus, ozonation definitely will improve the visibility of fish and the feeding and even growth rate as well. Uh, another uh, way is to disinfect water is UV disinfection. Uh, UV generally damages the genetic bacteria of bacteria and inactivates uh, uh, microorganisms in that way and thus uh, it uh, disinfects the water. So doses has to be standardized uh, properly for uh, proper uh, UV disinfection as well as the clarity of the water is most important for the efficiency of UV disinfection. So when you have all this system, when you put together, it will be looking something like this, where you have a culture tank, your, um, your uh, mechanical filter to remove solids. It can be drum filter and disinfected and degassed, biofiltered, and the water is oxygenated and sent back to the system. So this is our uh, system uh, in ICR DCFR, where we have uh, a small pilot scale which has um, capacity to produce uh, 2.5 tons of uh, fish per crop, uh, which has a moving bed bioreactor as a biological filter and drum filter and fuel separators for uh, removing the settling, uh, this settling solids and a UV filter for disinfection and oxygen and oxygenation cones. Uh, this is another system uh, which I used in Freshwater Institute USA. Um, it's mainly used for Atlantic salmon and uh, rainbow trout. This system consists of one meet, 150 meter cubic dual rain tank, and it, uh, radial flow separator, micro screen filter, pump sump, fluidized sand filter, and a carbon dioxide stripper and load uh, oxygenator, and uh, where oxygen and carbon uh, ozone is sub supplied. So as uh, in the inaugural uh, a speech DDJ and director sir, was mentioning that one of the major drawbacks um, of the RAs for implementation is high initial investment. Uh, that makes people reluctant to go for this technology, though this technology is so powerful. And another is the risk associated with that. Um, however, uh, that's that's why the Indian government is supporting uh, through PMSSY, um, PMM SSY program. Uh, for uh, part of the investment cost is subsidized. So that should really help. Another problem is energy requirement. There is a 24 into seven supply of electricity and power failure of 10 to 15 minutes can uh, even uh, result in loss of uh, fishes and complete loss of fishes. So backup measures are very much necessary. Uh, backup generator, backup pumps, oxygen supply units are very operational. And there should be a 24 into 7 monitoring as also is very much required if you want to successfully operate the system. These are the, some of the drawbacks uh, which uh, the system comes with. Another uh, uh, problem is uh, people think that, okay, the energy requirement, the operational energy, the cost that is required to produce a fish, a kg of fish. Uh, that is uh, energy cost of the fish production is anywhere between 4 to 10 kilowatt um, or 10 unit, units of electricity per kg of fish produced. That is what we get here in our system. We have around six. Uh, in our unit, we have around six units of electricity is required to produce one, every kg of fish. The electricity cost increases mainly due to if there is a heating or cooling has to be done to provide um, uh, uh, the suitable temperature. That's a major uh, uh, and electricity consuming part of the system. 
The other problems which are encountered in RAs uh, are metal toxicity, uh, which can be chronic copper toxicity, which can uh, cause uh, the mortality in fishes. This is mainly happens because the copper is added in feed. The, the fecal, fecal matter, if you are not efficient to removing the fecal matter properly, uh, that can leach into the water. And the use of copper plumbing material should be greatly avoided in this respect to avoid copper toxicity. And uh, yeah, we can avoid this copper toxicity by avoiding the copper piping, um, periodic flushing, and even ozone treatment, um, hydrolink loading. Ozone treatment also known to reduce the copper toxicity and other heavy metal, trace metal toxicity. Uh, another way is uh, keeping a hydraulic loading of one to three meter cube per kg of feed. That means every kg feed you provide, you can, it has to be, water has to be exchanged. That is one to 3000 liter of water has to be exchanged for every kg of feed to reduce uh, such kind of problems. One of the reason people might ask is that, is this 100% of the water can be recirculated in a system? But uh, uh, it is not possible to, 100% uh, uh, of the water to be recirculated. There is a need to change, the need to change the water uh, regularly. Uh, I mean to say that depends on the hydraulic loading. Hydraulic loading in the sense for every kg of feed, uh, one can exchange uh, one meter cube of water. This will avoid the problems which are, uh, such problems which come. The other problem which is coming uh, is noted in RAS is uh, off flavor, mostly geosmin and uh, methyl sobrineol or MIB. MIB. Uh, these problems encountered in recirculating bailey because of the, the uh, improper flushing and anoxic regions and improper uh, solid remo removal. This can be removed, um, this can be avoided by very good mechanical filtration, ozone disinfection. And depression can overcome uh, these geosmin uh, issues. Um, Dr. Biju will be talking more on this aspect. Another problem is encountered is hydrogen sulfide toxicity. Um, this is uh, happens if there is an anoxic zones in your in plumbing materials or anywhere in the tanks and the refiltration system where uh, hydrogen sulfide will, uh, will be produced from the bacterial growth under anoxic condition. Thus, uh, keep periodic cleaning and flushing of uh, filtration and plumbing is very necessary for uh, removing. Uh, and also, we should regularly monitor hydrogen sulfide level in the water. This will avoid these problems. Uh, now, coming to the design. Yeah, the, the, where is the, after understanding what is goes into the tank and what comes out from the tank and one of the, another factor we need to understand is what are the efficiency of each filtration system? Like solid, suppose a drum filter, how much of the solid it removes in a single pass? How much of the ammonia is removed uh, in a single pass? That comes the efficiency. How much of the um, ozone is required uh, to disinfect? And what should be the flow rate? These, comes, these factor comes in the um, uh, design aspect. Before designing, first we should look into that uh, what is our budget? That is the major factor we'll be considering before design, design and, and the production level. These are the two factors. First, we'll be considered before design, which has to be ascertained based on the budget and the species which is cultured and the state of the stage of the fish which is produced and the final stocking density which you want to achieve. In that, considering this aspect and as well as your source water level, um, these are the uh, parameters should be considered before designing the system. Designing is nothing but watches the choice, uh, basically choice of the system to get the highest efficiency at the lowest cost and with the maximized production. So basically choice of culture tanks, uh, sizing of swill separators, culture tanks, sizing of plumbing materials, what should be the uh, diameter of plumbing materials, and sizing of drum filter or mechanical equipment. Drum filters are generally sized to the flow rate of or turnover time, what we say, uh, in an hour or to completely turn over the system volume, how much time it takes. That is called TOT or turnover time. So the drum filters are sized to, to TOT, uh, generally are kept more than the TOT. Um, uh, 
uh, mostly double than the TOT requirement that will help in uh, proper function of drum filter. Sizing and choice of biofilter is very important. This depends on the uh, in the, the the type of biofilter. For example, if you are uh, in in our case, we are using K5 medias, uh, Carlness 5 media, uh, moving bed bioreactors. So for uh, that media to remove uh, ammonia from every uh, 20 to 30, uh, 20 kg of uh, feed that is uh, ammonia generated from 20 kg of feed, we require a one metric meter cube of media. So it also all depends on the, uh, the efficiency of the uh, biofilter, how efficiently they remove ammonia and the degassing unit as well, uh, we require. And the second is uh, deciding on water pumps based on the TOT. Uh, what should be the TOT? For example, for rainbow trout, uh, the flow rate uh, required for um, optimum mixing and oxygen supply, ammonia flushing and solid removal, uh, fish swimming, proper fish, fish swimming behavior. The thumb rule is TOT should be uh, anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes for stocking density of uh, more than 40 kg per meter cube. So we, I'm also sharing with the, the experience what we have seen from last two years from ICRDCFR uh, RS facility. So we have a system, uh, total volume of 50 meter cube, um, tank volume of seven meter cube, production capacity <clears throat> of 2.5 uh, tons per crop in a six months. And uh, we can increase the production to 80 kg per meter cube with the oxygenation and ozone treatment. What we have achieved is, uh, we have achieved the growth rate of 100 to 900 gram in 171 days, which takes, otherwise takes more than two years in case of in flow through systems. Uh, in the, this year we have, uh, are currently more than uh, 800 kg of fish in the system at a stocking density of 30 kg per meter cube. We are targeting uh, 80 kg per meter cube this year. Uh, as a, uh, uh, in the initial uh, presentation, it was um, told that ultimately it is the money which uh, makes uh, everybody's interested in money uh, when we are going for RAS, whether we can we make money. So we studied some of the economic parameters of our system. If you look into the uh, we system, we categorized into two part, two production scenario at 40 kg per meter cube and 80 kg per meter cube. Uh, we require various units like culture tanks, drum filter, biofilter, pumps, UV aerator, oxygen, cones and oxygenators, electric panels, generators, and of course, DH, DO and pH meter weighing balance. If you look at the scenario, the initial cost is not different between the system much. Uh, why? Because the extra cost only added because of the oxygenator and oxygen cones. Uh, the other operating cost, uh, it's somewhere like a feed, seed, electricity and fuel, water quality analyzing kits, sodium bicarbonate, uh, which is need to add it for maintenance of alkalinity, salt in case of, um, um, salt is generally added in even in freshwater system to maintain, maintain uh, uh, 200, um, generally because any spike in nitrate toxicity, uh, 200 ppb level of, uh, sorry, 200 ppm level of uh, uh, chloride ion through addition of sodium chloride is maintained for healthy um, production of rainbow trouts. Uh, that is good. So generally it's good to maintain around 200 ppm level of uh, salinity. So there is also requirement of labor um, uh, for monitoring of the system and operate feeding and uh, other uh, cleaning activities. So, which is uh, the system operating cost in both, you can see that the total fixed cost is somewhere around 25, 23 to 27 lakh in both the system and operating cost of six to 12 lakhs. In and if you look into the production scenario, at, at the stocking density, current stocking density, 40 kg per meter cube, we can produce uh, almost 2,500 kg of fish which can, uh, we can sold, uh, sell at uh, current market price of 500 rupees per kg. We can generate an income of 12.75 lakhs. So net profit of 6.6 .6, uh, lakh. 
So to achieve a break-even point period, we need to take minimum four crops uh, in, in this particular uh, 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 production scenario of stocking density 40 kg per meter cube. If it is uh, 80 kg per meter cube, uh, the, at, then we can produce uh, uh, almost five, five tons of fish, uh, roughly around 25 lakh rupees can be earned. Uh, net profit is of 12 or 13 lakh rupees. So with this scenario, uh, the break-even point can be achieved within uh, two crops within one year. So we are targeting this stocking density this year. And uh, successful. Uh, with margin can and in this should be beneficial in terms of reducing the burden and initial investment. Uh, with this, uh, I will end the presentation. For further reading, uh, you can also refer to Recirculatory Aquaculture book. Uh, we can one of the best book uh, for understanding more about recirculating aquaculture. And you can also refer recent publication from Freshwater Institute, which uh, working in uh, this institute, particularly working in RAS from North more than uh, 30 years. And of course, we, uh, I welcome you to contact me for any problem, um, any issues or any more understanding related to Rx. Somebody wants specific help, you can contact. This is email ID. And uh, I would like to thank you everybody for uh, participation, uh, especially for director and DDG for giving a very nice uh, um, uh, introduction and opportunity. Um, especially, I want to also thank um, Mr. Vignesh and Varun, who are always helping me in the maintaining of RAS. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, the questions can be taken uh, in the chat box at the end. We will try to answer the question at the end. Now, uh, we will move on to the second phase of uh, presentation by Dr. Biju Sam Kamalam on um, SOP on RAS. Uh, over to you, Dr. Biju. Is <laughs> Can you allow me to uh, share the screen, please? Uh, now, Bitu, you can set the screen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so is the screen visible to everyone? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, am I audible and uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, Biju, you can go ahead. Yeah, we can see, you can see your oh, screen. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think the previous pres uh, presentation comprehensively, you know, covered a lot of many things. Uh, Dr. Rajesh uh, talked in detail about uh, almost all the aspects of, you know, uh, recirculating aquaculture systems. Just following up with that, like probably I'll be just briefly uh, putting in like, you know, 
some practical standard operating protocols probably what we have to you know look at to avoid problems in our system probably for, this is mainly for risk avoidance and what exactly we should do and we should not do like uh, some of the things is very basic like we all know that and some things probably can be new for you so i'll just uh, go with that so i structured the presentation uh, in this order like for example just um, to begin with like when we have to study a problem if we can relate it with uh, you know our own body and see if there is any similarities between an uh, us and rs that can uh, make the understanding a little more clear about what problem can come and then like i'll just go on to uh, talk about like you know like what are the common reasons why rs had failed in uh, some of the cases and then um, we'll be talking about what is the points of critical care like what are the major points that we have to really uh, you know take into consideration like when we are really working on rs and then like we are out of that points of critical care we'll go uh, into fish stocking and biomass monitoring feed formulation water quality management um biosecurity and health management and product quality assurance and waste management so these are the things just uh, probably i'll try to quickly cover up because a lot of the things you have heard already so i'm just going to um go just to you know like uh, tell what exactly um can you relate the human body and rs you know like and understand like what problems can come in that so if you think that way first of all like an rs should have an enclosure and that's more or less like the integumentary system in our body like the skins the hair and all these things part, uh, is a part of that organ system in our body and if you uh, if you can understand like any problem that we have in our skin like is the, if there is a bruise or anything like that like we are giving uh, an opportunity for a secondary infection and the same thing happens with an rs rs enclosure if it is not well enclosed you know like especially the closed systems I'm not talking about the outdoor systems here if the indoor uh, closed rs systems are not well you know like protected like uh, we are just paving way for a lot of uh, harmful algal growth there and a lot of things which we cannot control so and then like if you look into the rearing tanks and the fish that will be having in that system we can equate to the musculoskeletal system of ours like because the fish is going to be the muscle and the tank is going to be the skeleton of the entire thing and then if you look at it like um, one of the main thing is the water pumps and plumbing that's kind of the heart of the system and that's why you know it performs exactly the similar function of a human heart where like it pumps in blood throughout and the same thing water carries life here in the rs system and that's pumped by the water pumps and the plumbing uh, channels and then we have uh, the oxygen system and degasses so i'm just summarizing basically like uh, what dr rajesh covered so like uh, when we talk about oxygen system and degasses basically what they do is oxygen systems like they through them like we add oxygen to the system and degasses we remove uh, you know carbon dioxide so you can clearly relate it to the lungs so it's the respiratory system that we can relate to and if you look at the mechanical and biological filtration we can relate it with the digestive and excretory system because like uh, we have a solid removal system probably like once the food is digested it's going to be you know going out as feces and then we are going to have uh, you know particle filtrations like which probably happens in the kidney and then like liver serves as detoxifying agents and then uh, we'll be aware that like our you know intestine has a lot of microbes which uh, converts and plays a role as a third genome right so the same thing is applicable here in the rs also that is a very important system where the nutrients are really metabolized and used so um, and again like if you look at the ra systems we have a lot of you know electrical wiring and control panels and regulators to uh, see that all the equipments are working in the right time and uh, everything like is connected to the main power and that is equivalent to the nervous and endocrine system because the regulators are more or less like the endocrine system we can relate to and then we have the uv filtration or ozone generators which is more or less equivalent to the lymphatic or immune system because it fights against the microbes and takes off the harmful microbes out of the system and then like we have uh, water quality and uh, fish monitoring systems this is one of the important systems to really see that like our system is working well and um, that comes as the sensory system in our body so we can uh, you know see what exactly is going on there we can feel exactly what is available for the fishes in the system so uh, and again if you look at it like even like you know compared to the human reproductive system like that actually provides another generation it allows another generation to come up and the same thing like if you look at the rs it's all about production and profitability at the end 
like if the production profitability is working all together well like probably the crop cycles will be sustainable and it will be keeping on going so this is how uh, we can summarize the ra system and then like if you look at it like for example if we take up the pumps like uh, if there is a problem in the heart like we get a heart attack like basically and most of the systems if you look at it the brain if it has a issue you get a stroke so that's the same thing that happens with the ra system you know like if the brain or the you know electrical supply is not available to the system it gets a stroke it's getting paralyzed totally and that's why the fishes are dying and the second thing if you look at the heart if the heart stops there is nothing going on and then if oxygen is not uh, given you know like uh, the fishes get suffocated so all these systems we can now relate and we can feel you know like what is happening in our human body if a problem comes to us how we are going to deal with it the same way we are going to uh, have a risk assessment and what we can do what we should not do in our is that's what we are going to look up in the next slides and one thing that uh, before the presentation like i mean going into the details uh, what i want to say is operation and maintenance of ra systems is not something that like one size uh, fits all like it's not like that like we cannot say that you generalize and say these are the regulations you follow this you are not going to have any issues nothing works like that every system has its own unique you know problems and has its own unique solutions so like when you are uh, probably starting up your own areas or any way you are doing it to give a consultancy or something you have to really be aware that like each system is unique and uh, just to give you an example again from the human side itself you know like for example a baby and an adult man can't wear the same dress can't eat the same food and they can't live in the same sort of way and can't do the same things and the same things is applicable to different farms because farms are very much different based on their location where they are uh, the water source and the quality is not the same across the sites or across the farms so comparisons uh, cannot be made always yeah there can be generalizations but we have to be very careful about making comparative assessments and then like our system design and components these are not same across the systems every system has its own uh, you know components there and then we have scale of operation some can be really small and some can go up to you know like uh, some 100000 tons uh, capacity rs units also people are establishing it so scale of operation can be different and when the scale of operation changes the entire sop changes basically the operating practice changes so this we have to keep in mind and fish species importantly like for example uh, in the previous presentation we heard like just like you know like each fish species has its own unique requirement for uh, environmental characteristics for nutritional characteristics or their well being and everything so like we have to be careful which fish we are going to grow in the system and the system has to be designed according to that and then like we have to look at the stage of production for example within the same species there can be different recirculating aquaculture loops for uh, example for a hatchery for a nursery for a grow out system or for a reproduction based system so we have to be very careful like which system what is the target like where we are addressing which stage of production are we addressing and then we have to look at the input qualities for example if there is a bad feed that we are giving probably that can harm a lot and that will compromise everything else and then one important and very critical thing in rs uh, which actually makes it a uh, uh, trouble is that skill manpower it's not like the traditional system in a traditional system if you look at it if a person understands about the fish biology if he knows that the fish is going to perform this way he can do that aquaculture but then in ra system when it comes to it he has to be well aware of uh, well aware of the biology of the fish he has to be well aware of, well aware of how to control the water quality and he has to be well aware about the machines which is involved and how to you know like uh, repair or maintain them so these are things like is unique to systems and we have to be careful there and the target if we look at it like you know one of the main thing that we have to have before even we design a system is that we have to have a system and species knowledge we have to say exactly okay what is going to be my capacity okay and uh, in the early percent we were talking about turnover time so what is going to be my whole volume of water will change within how many time and for each of my tank how much of flow rate i'm going to set so all these things we have to decide prior to you know putting up that system or buying individual components so based on that design only we can get the other components so we have to clearly know our requirements and go according to that by the way equipments according to that and then we have to clearly do a risk and vulnerability assessment okay i'm going to put up a farm uh, in another place where like you know 
probably power supply is very much interrupted. So now I have to calculate the cost of not only the electric electricity, how much of fuel I'm going to put into my generator, that cost comes in. So, and again, machine repairs, like if it is in a very remote place, my RAS farm, like can I, you know, can I get it repaired within a shorter time? Like can a person can come and repair it? Like will, will I get a service person? So all these things adds to the risk and vulnerability assessment. And then if you look at it, uh, emergency backup, that's highly critical here. For example, you know, um, anything can happen in an RS in any time because like it's a very fragile but intensive system. So we have to be very careful about the choices that we have. We have to have a generator. We have to have an oxygen supply unit. We have to have good source, at least for exchanging the water because mostly RAS, we put it in a place where like water is not available to that extent. So when we are thinking about that, we have to be careful, like how much of percentage of water exchange we can do to, you know, like uh, sustain the fish or to keep the fish alive for a certain time if electricity is not there. So all these things we have to keep in mind, emergency and backup measures, and then operational efficiency. Ultimately, the profitability is based on the operational efficiency of the system. So uh, we need to look at the feeding schedules that we have to follow. It's not that like, uh, like an outside system, we can feed it to visual saturation and say everything is going to be okay, because even a little bit of overfeeding is going to cause harm to the system. So we have to be very careful there. And then we have to be aware of uh, how best we can utilize the space which is available, the carrying capacity which is available, and all the energy spent. So we have to go for batch culture and kind of multi-phase harvesting. So I'll go into the details uh, slightly, right? So one point here, the take home point here is like uh, all the RA systems are unique and like we cannot generalize SOPs across the systems beyond a certain level. And then like, if you look at it across the world, like the, uh, a lot of people have taken up and invested huge monies in RAs. It's not a small money as we talk in lakhs, like they put uh, crores of rupees in RAs and at one point of time, they've stopped it. And we have to seriously, before we start, we have to learn from that failure to be successful. So uh, if you look at some of the common reasons why RS has failed, we should be aware of that. First thing is, uh, first and foremost, if you think it's because of poor planning and design of the RS facility and constituents. Like sometimes what we do is, we underestimate or overestimate uh, carrying capacity. We underestimate and overestimate what is required in terms of the uh, accessories that I need to have, how much of the biofilter volume I should have, how much of the drum filter capacity I should have, how much of you know the solid removal efficiency or the capacity should be there, and what should be my pumping, pumping efficiency, and to have the stocking density, will I, will I meet that desired level of water flow? All these things play a very important role. So. Uh, Integrate parameter design calculations is one of the biggest costs why like RS facilities fails. People who plan it well, design it well, always they have turned up to be successful also. So this is one thing. And then like when we are planning a system, we should not be too optimistic because a lot of mistakes comes with too much of optimism. We have to go on conservative estimates on not on um, higher estimates. So that is one thing that we have to follow. And then the second biggest reason like why RIS failures have been observed is because of uh, poor management. So uh, if you think that like, you know, like it's easier, like traditional systems, like a flow through system, it's easy to manage. It's not like that. It's a very management intensive system where like uh, every time, like, I mean, like 24 into seven, you have to be following up with the water quality. You have to have really good understanding of how every component works and how everything has to be controlled. So, um, one of the issues why RA systems fails is because management concerns and then uh, because of lack of proper training and uh, knowledge. Because like we start with art knowledge and sometimes, you know, that becomes dangerous. So this is also something that we have to keep in mind. And then like if you look at it, another main reason is that like when we make mistakes in the first point, like for example, when we don't design it well, what happens is that we have inadequate solid removal we have inadequate biofiltration, and then we cannot regulate ammonia, dissolved oxygen, and carbon dioxide as we wish. So this is another reason why RA systems fails. And then like, uh, we should be aware that the equipments are prone to uh, you know, repairs and failures. And then we need skilled manpower to immediately you know, solve that mechanical problems. So everything cannot be done by, that, uh, by us. So how, how much of a backup I have in that, and how quickly can I rectify those problems? These are things that we have to keep in mind because these problems have hampered RA systems. And then like we have to see like if power failures and one bad alarm connection, 
And if you don't have enough, you know, uh, response measures, like we know suddenly accidentally something is happening, an unforeseen event is happening. If you don't have an emergency backup, like we are going to lose our stock. So we have to be careful about that. And then we have to be very much aware of uh, suboptimal conditions, because like in suboptimal conditions, growth rate will be compromised, feed utilization will be compromised. And in that sense, the, you know, culture duration prolongs and every day brings its own cost. So the shorter the duration, the faster the growth, better the feed utilization, more your profit. Anything of this gets prolonged, anything gets slower, like the profit margin is going to fall down. So this is another reason why uh, RA systems have failed globally. And again, like um, we have to be aware of occurrence of diseases and difficulty in treating them. This is not like a con conventional system where you can go and throw anything like an antibiotic or any control measure. We have to be very aware that like what we are going to cause a put is not only for the pathogen, it's for going to harm the microbes, which is there in the system also, which is so crucial. So uh, it's difficult treating them. It's better preventing diseases. So occurrence of diseases has actually caused a lot of losses and shutdowns in um, RS. This is one of the major points. And then poor quality of the final product. Sometimes what happens is that like um, when there is a lot of biofilm formation and some of the bacteria causes a lot of off flavor from geosmin and uh, methyl isoboniol, um, the product is not accepted by the market and then like that brings down the cost. So for example, again, like if your marketing approach is not well planned, that has also caused failures. And then excessive confidentiality and lack of information sharing. I know something I'm not going to tell to anybody else. So RIS industries, if you look overall, um, there is very few commercial industries who can give a little amount of data in the public. Everything is confidential. So in that sense, like when there is no knowledge sharing, it becomes very difficult to sort out problems based on another experience. And a uh, lot of time goes on reinventing the whole thing. And if you look at it like, yeah, of course, we know that like it's capital intensive. But then like one of the reasons which has been pointed out for uh, the systems which has been shut down across the globe is that uh, slow payback period. So average, one study has been uh, done based on a survey based study by Bariola. Uh, and they just pointed out that like the average payback time was eight years in huge RA systems. And uh, the operational cost involved and repair and replacement cost, which is coming in the middle of that becomes a little bit of a trouble. So we have to be aware of all these things before we are just planning and designing. So when we are planning it properly, definitely RAS people are doing it very successfully also. Like when Netherlands started it, like there was 300 tons produced and now across the globe, like uh, I think like more than 30,000 tons um, of rainbow trout itself is being produced. So that's huge amount. So. Um, we can see the potential definitely is there, but like planning has to be perfect. So that's the point here. And then if you look at the critical control points, we have to be uh, starting with the stocking. So we have to stock appropriately and we have to maintain a desired water flow for all the stock that we are keeping there. And then we have to really select the feeds and feeding methods very carefully. And we should be aware that the feeds is going to have an influence on the solid removal and biofiltration efficiency. So all are interconnected here. The stocking is interconnected with the feed and the feed is interconnected with the solid removal and all these are interconnected. And then if you look at it, another critical control point is uh, oxygen demand. So if oxygen demand increases and if it is not, if we are not able to supply that, our uh, carrying capacity will decrease or we'll face losses. And then like we have to remember that uh, carbon dioxide is an ignored factor. And uh, even in uh, global commercial surveys, uh, not much degasses are given, but then the truth is that like without degasses, the performance is compromised and uh, mortalities happens. And pH adjustment stations has to be given to really maintain the pH and alkalinity in an optimal range, because this is a very fluctuating factor which can go up and down and has to be kept constant because uh, higher, uh, like if the pH is higher, it's going to create a trouble with ammonia. If it is lower, it's going to create a trouble with carbon dioxide. So we have to be very careful there. And then we have to remember that uh, water quality analysis has to be done regularly and then like as and when required water exchange provision should be there. Like we should be able to perform a water exchange. And then like uh, one of the critical thing that we have to maintain is that like uh, we have to keep on monitoring and understanding how the fish is behaving in the system. And that itself is a reflection of how we can take it. And um, we have to remember that like uh, prevention is always better. So prevention of stressful conditions is the first main thing that we have to have as a critical control point. And then again, like, uh, early identification and prevention of diseases, like kind of when you are putting the stocking material itself, 
you are either treating them and uh, or quarantining them and making sure that like they are not bringing in any pathogens that's going to be beneficial and then the process of depuration and uh, removal of off flavor is going to be very important to have the better product quality and a better market price and then of course like uh, ras can be a very efficient uh, closed loop economy like or a circular economy and there like the waste of ras can be reused in ras itself like i'll just point out a few of the examples down uh, and then like we need to definitely have emergency backup so these are the critical control points we have to keep in mind and then if we uh, come to the first thing like uh, just i'll quickly brush through is that like three things we have to keep in mind when we are going for the stocking the first thing is ca carrying capacity of the rearing unit we should know how much volume we have uh, and how much is the oxygen availability to the system because uh, some of the bigger systems have made minor as small mistakes like this for example i'll give you an example like where like the oxygen demand will be calculated they'll calculate the demand of the fish but they won't calculate the demand of the microbes which is in the uh, by filter and that small difference has caused failures for our system so we have to be careful about the carrying total carrying capacity of the rearing unit and then the productivity that we are targeting the size at harvest what we are targeting and the initial weight which we are planning to put in so these are the things with, that we have to be very careful when we are going for the stocking and then we have to look at um, how uh economically and efficiently if we can operate uh, for higher profitability that depends definitely on the percentage utilization of the carrying capacity if my carrying capacity is uh say like 2 tons and if i am operating it at 100 kilos for almost 3 or 4 months i am at lost so we have to go for a multi phased and multiple stocking and harvesting way so that batch cultures can be done and then uh, we have to remember that, like uh, you know, it's very important to record the growth rate, fish size numbers, and biomass because we have to predictively know how much of biomass is going to be there, how much of oxygen demand is going to be there, and make decisions accordingly. So this is more of a forecasting thing that we have to be doing. And then we have to keep a record of all the fishes which is coming in, how much fish is dying, how much is going out, how much I am selling it, because batch by batch we are doing it. And then, in fact, we can schedule a stocking frequency itself. Okay, I'm going to stock every quarterly period. I'm going to stock in January, April, and uh, like that, like we can keep, or we can keep cold banks. What they call as cold banks is that you can stunt and keep your fishes just till the next crop goes out. You can sell out the next crop, and then you just take them to the growth stage. So these things are all there. And then you can go for, you know, um, isolating the cohorts. Whatever batches you're putting, you have to, you know, maintain a traceability so that, like, you can maintain biosecurity measures well. And then in an advanced way, if you look at it like now for real time biomass monitoring that are machine machine systems or machine learning systems. So artificial intelligence systems. Uh, one example that I can give is observed technologies um, where like, you know, you can see every individual fish and you can know its activities, how much weight gain it's happening, how much size gain is happening. So these are measures like that's coming up and especially that's uh, very useful in areas. And coming to the nutrition point, like if you look at the whole life cycle of rainbow trout, I'm not going to go into the details. But then if you look at it, um, we can see that uh, from the first feeding stage itself, they are able to take accept artificial feed. So straight away, unlike many other commercial fish species, uh, you can straight away feed them 0.3 to 0.5 mm crumbles and they're going to take it in until the end of that life cycle, like you can keep on feeding them. So feed plays a crucial role. And if you look at uh, the feed and feeding practices and the SOPs we should maintain in that, first of all, we should know that like we should meet the, we in an RA system, it's not like a traditional system. We have to meet the complete nutritional requirement of the target fish. There cannot be a possibility like uh, supplementary feeding. So we should know the nutritional requirements and we should have a feed which meets the entire nutrient requirement. And then we should be cautious not to use any cheap and low quality feeds. If you are going to use, we are going to totally spoil the system we are ultimately so we have to be very careful there and then like based on the stocking biomass water quality and system filtration capacity an optimum feeding uh, schedule should be followed we should not drastically change the feeding schedules it should not go really high within a short period of span and uh,
I think Gizu is not audible. I think clearly track. If one consignment came uh, bad, like we should be able to rectify that in the next go. And then, like in huge large scale operations, we can go for demand or automatic feeders. That's going to save a lot of uh, time, labor, as well as it's going to be beneficial because you can put it in a controlled way. And then we can look at it the physical quality of the feed. That is very, very important in an RS. Like, for example, if you're having a feed which has a very less binding capacity or, a, you know, poor water stability, that's going to contribute immensely to the solids which is going and then like particulate matter which is going and it will override the filtration systems that we have. The filtration systems that we have cannot meet out that requirement. So we have to be very careful. And uh, for that, like we should be aware that like already globally, if you look, look at it, companies like Scretting, they're producing RA specific feeds itself, which is called as RX feed. So um, the direction is already it's going on and people are doing a lot of work in that. And just to talk about some common risks and how I'm going to act to that. Okay, if, in an, if my RA system, I'm just observing this practically, my fish is not eating, what should I do? I should not feed it actually. I should stop it and remove the uneaten feed from there and wait and see like how much it takes in later on. And immediately I have to check the water quality. So again, if my water quality is bad, again, I should not feed it. And till I rectify the water quality and make it normal, I have to keep the feeding either for the maintenance ratio or I can stop it for a certain time. And again, the same applies for stressed and diseased fishes. If I know that my fish is stressed or diseased, I need to be very careful not to feed them. I have to collect the sick fish, diagnose it, sort it out, and then again. And if my feed has excessive fines, excessive fines is kind of a lot of uh, damages and you know brokenness is there. And that's going to, again, put a heavy load on the filtration efficiency. Like, And uh, it's going to cost a lot of particulate matter to go into the drum filters or micro screen filters. So, um, the suggested thing is either we should avoid using that feed or we should remove the fines thoroughly before feeding the, that feed. And if we think that like we can feed old feed or uh, moldy feed or anything which has become wet, uh, strongly advised not to use that and like you have to dispose that basically. And water quality management, if we come to water quality management, that's a very critical thing. We have different sets of tasks in our water quality management aspect. We have tasks which are, we have to do it on a daily basis. We have, to, we have tasks which we can do it on a weekly basis, monthly basis, quarterly basis, yearly basis. So everything is sorted out. We have to have a clear standard operating procedure even before we start so that we make sure that like we are make, not making a mistake on a daily basis. So the, if you look at a daily task, the first thing is we have to visually examine the water quality. If it is really turbid or not, is it clear? And we have to look at the hydrodynamics, like it's all my flow at the desired level, is it reducing? Because the pipes can get clogged. So we have to be very aware of all these things. And then we have to uh, remove the bottom residues. So like in, every morning we can just flush out a little bit the bottom outlet so that like we can remove the solids. And so that the load which is going to the drum filter and biofilter will be less. I mean, the solid removal efficiency uh, will be better. And then we have to repeatedly measure oxygen concentration. That's important. Like the best thing is if you have a real time measurement stuff, that's excellent. Otherwise we have to repeatedly measure it because oxygen is a very critical variable there. And then we have to check and record the solid removal efficiency. If the solid removal efficiency is not proper, it's going to clog the biofilter and that's going to cause Again, problems of decomposition, hydrogen sulfide and everything. So we have to be very careful that. And then on a daily basis, we have to record temperature, pH, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, alkalinity, and all these things are important to know how the biofilters is functioning. And then we have to look at the water levels in the sump. So the reservoirs that we have, we have to look at the nozzles in the mechanical filter or the drum filter. Is it all working good? Is anything broken? Is it all spraying up in the right way? And then we have to record and use electricity on a daily basis. If you are doing it, we can easily calculate the energy cost at the end of our production. So in one cycle or two cycle, when you do that, and repeatedly, if you are maintaining a logbook like that, you'll know how energy efficient you can make the system with slow changes. And then we have to ensure that there is no drastic change in water quality. Because if there is a drastic change in water quality, two things can happen. One, with an acute effect, the fishes will die. If it is a chronic effect, it will have a long-term growth impairment impact. So like we have to avoid both these things. And if you look at a long term or a weekly, monthly, quarterly management strategy, like our SOP, which we should follow, we should check and clean the biofilters to avoid particle clogging. That we have to be doing it on a weekly or a monthly basis uh, so that the biofilter is functioning properly. And then we have to look at uh, to calibrate the water quality analytical equipment because if the readings that we are getting is wrong, everything goes uh, wrong. So, like, we have to make sure that the instruments that we are using is 
working properly. And then we have to check alarms and emergency backups regularly and even do trials every monthly so that like anything happens anytime, we'll be able to switch on and immediately it works. And then we have to uh, look at the pumps, motors, and all these finer things with the filtration systems. Uh, and another important thing is we have to look at dead water in the system. So what the, that means is not enough oxygen is given to that place, like or that place is becoming anaerobic. You have to be very careful. Like So those sort of systems, I mean, spots we should not allow within our rearing tanks. And then we should uh, not allow any sludge to be observed in our sums, filter sums. And then we have to clean our UV filters, degasses, everything. So all the uh, parts has to be having a regular cleaning schedule for all the RAS components. And another important thing that like uh, finally Dr. Rajesh mentioned was, we have to really assess how much of uh, trace elements, heavy metals and other components are accumulating. Because a lot of studies have pointed out the trace elements, heavy metals and uh, hormone accumulation, the system is affecting the performance, is affecting the nutrient retention, is affecting it's probably causing toxic effects. For example, trace elements like copper, zinc, and even like they're finding out lead and things in the RA systems accumulating. So we have to be very uh, careful about uh, how much of accumulation of trace elements is happening. This also, we can monitor on a monthly or a quarterly basis to know exactly what's happening with our system so that we can sort it out with water exchange measures. So for water quality management, what can be the common risks and action? So some of the main things which happens is suddenly my dissolved oxygen level can go down. So one option immediately I have is I have to provide aeration or I have to have my oxygen supply system immediately I have to turn on to inject pure oxygen. And again, if my biofilter is not working properly, I'll have high ammonia nitrogen level. So we can add zeolite, which can absorb, uh, you know, absorb with ammonia or immediately I have to stop feeding. So that extra load is not going to the biofilter and uh, extra ammonia nitrite is not coming to the system. Same thing with high nitrite. When high nitrite is there, brown red disease happens. And um, if we can add sodium chloride and useful microbes, we can sort out this issue. And for every one ppm of nitrate, which we have to neutralize, we have to have 10 to 20 ppm of chloride ions. So we have to be very careful there. And then um, high carbon dioxide is uh, another major issue. There also we have to aerate or do water exchange. And when temperature differences are there, if we can have thermoregulatory measures, that's good. Otherwise we have to control with the oxygen levels in the system. And then uh, I think like I saw many of the questions also about all these things in your uh, uh, question and I answer section. Like if pH is uh, different, like we have to definitely modify it. There is a pH dosing station in the RAS loop where like we'll be dosing uh, sodium uh, uh, bicarbonate. So like we can add basically baking soda and limestone, agricultural limestone, cheap alternatives. And we can, you know, like uh, maintain the alkalinity. For, um, you know, uh, reducing the pH, we have to use mineral acids, but in a very careful way. We have to be careful how we are using the uh, hydrochloric acid. And then like another major issue is high solid slow because like when the filters are clogging and my solid removal efficiency is not good, my turbidity is going to be too high. And when turbidity is going to be high, like it's going to be affect the performance of the entire system. So clean the filters regularly. And uh, once we can clean and keep it, that's the thing. And just let us imagine I'm an emergency scenario. Now suddenly power cut goes or my pump gets failed or uh, oxygen depletion happens. What I'm going to do immediately. That's something that I have to think even before I put the system. So the first thing is I should have a backup electricity generator because as I said, electricity is the brain. If the brain doesn't work, straight away stroke. So we have to be very careful that we have a generator to back up every time a system which is put. And then we have to have spares or redundant pumps. Like if you have extra pumps, if you have an extra filtration system, then that gives us a flexibility. If one doesn't work immediately, we can reroute it to the other system. And then like that is helping us. So that we have to be aware. Uh, and then like we have to provide immediately pure oxygen we have to inject so that emergency situation is immediately met out. And then we have to have an alarm or an emergency notifying system so that like the key people immediately are aware of that and goes and sort out the issue. And then another important thing that we have to keep in mind is the staff who are working there has to be trained to quickly respond to an emergency. So if you are not trained to respond to an emergency, that time gap is enough to, uh, for us to lose the stock. So that also has to be well planned before. And in terms of health man management, if you look at it, um, the best thing to do is every day morning, like we can just observe the fish behavior in a non-turbulent environment. So just we can put off the oxygen for some time and look into the tanks and see like how my fishes are behaving. Is there abnormal swimming activities? 
like are they swimming laterally are they swimming upside down is there whirling moments so all these things if i see i can just know okay is everything okay or not and then we can physically see uh, the deformities which is there in the fish like uh, bulged eye exophthalmia or a vertebral deformity fin rods uh, skin lesions we see abnormal coloration or some growth in the body so all these things when we see we know that like there is some problem going on and immediately we have to sample and do a disease diagnosis there and then the best thing to do is minimize handling the more we handle the fishes the more we are subjecting them to stress and uh, making them susceptible to pathogens so we have to be careful there and uh, maintaining optimal water quality conditions at all time is a gold standard there there is no compromise to that and whenever we find that water quality is not optimal immediately we have to do water exchange and make the conditions optimal before continuing with our culture cycle and then we have to strictly follow biosecurity measures so what exactly is that like if i'm using one net basically the best case is if i'm using one net if i'm using one feeding thing or any sampling thing for a tank i have to use it only for that tank for the second tank i have everything new so these sort of biosecurity strict biosecurity if we have uh, we can prevent disease occurrence in the rs because in rs always we have to keep it in mind it's best to prevent than treat um and then quickly going to the next one like we have to do periodic checkups and then all the dead mortally sick individuals should be removed and immediately we have to identify the causative agent of any disease and we have to remember that treating fish uh, with using therapeutics or drugs in an rs system should be our last resort if we don't have any option we have to do that and that too we cannot use anything like for example we cannot use antibiotics or anything we can use salt salt is a good thing like uh, we can even go up to 3 to 4 percentage because the freshwater fishes can uh, tolerate that even for fresh water i am talking so salt can be a good treatment for especially ectoparasites and then we can go for hydrogen peroxide um, parasitic acid formula and other compounds which won't affect the biofiltration system and then like in any case of disease or stress we have to withhold feed we should not feed the animals and we have to see that like the filtration efficiency is better the solids are removed well the organics are removed well we are not giving a space for the uh, pathogen to grow there that's important and then the thing that we have to have is a component to disinfect the water completely with ultraviolet radiation and ozone treatment as dr rajesh explained earlier so consider that we have an emergency scenario okay um we have a disease scenario where we are having high mortality first thing we should have avoided that we should have had a very clear biosecurity plan and solution and we should have used only certified pathogen free ex or quarantine zoonites if you are not using it we are asking for trouble and even okay suddenly the disease occurrence is there high mortality is there immediately we have to remove the dead fishes because we are giving a scope for the pathogen to grow again and again there and cause the disease so we have to take it out collect the morbid fishes diagnose it and find a, the right way to treat them and one with thing we can do is we can increase aeration try to make the water quality as optimal as possible for the animals so that like at least we are giving them a conducive atmosphere to do that and then uh, following disinfection and biosecurity protocol is important to uh, avoid the spread of the disease and um, treatment procedures should be started but we have to be knowing that like how to exactly we treat so we reduce the water in the tank we put a concentrated amount give them a bath treatment and then increase the water and just put them in the system so it goes in a diluted whatever drug we are using whatever therapeutic we are using goes in a diluted form to the other component so that we have to be very careful so and we have to restrict access to the facility and include hygiene barriers that's very important and uh, quickly to uh, go through the next stuffs um one important thing as we said is uh, the problem is off flavor that comes because we have to remember that we are reducing the water requirement by 100 times that means instead of 3 lakhs we are making it 3000 liters so basically we are reusing the water again and again again and again so there is a lot of accumulation of different things that even biofilm formation is there or streptomyces biofilm causes geosmin so there is bacteria of the cyanobacterial group and the other groups which forms geosmin and uh, methyl isobutene also and those things just are dissolved i mean the dissolved uh, compound so it just gets into the body and accumulates in lipid rich tissue so we have to and uh, particularly rainbow trout and all are uh, having a lot of lipid in its body so it gets accumulated so salmonids especially we have to do a depuration so how do we do a depuration we have to transfer uh, the fishes from the rs to a clean flow through or a partial water use systems where there is no biofilm or anything and we have to keep them without feeding for 10 to 15 days because these are studies these are based on studies which have already been done uh, probably we have to modify a little bit but more or less we are we have to do this for rainbow trout specifically and 10 to 15 days in a biofilm free environment again the accumulated uh, geosmin and uh, mib will just move out and just 
uh, we can reduce the off flavor in the system. So flushing has to be higher. So this is one thing. And then like we can have few other things like, you know, if we disinfect the depuration system one hour before with hydrogen peroxide, that is told to reduce the off flavor even pronouncedly. And same way, if you use the water in that um, depuration tank with carbon filtration, activated carbon filtration, that also will reduce the off flavor. So these are things which we have to keep in mind because if the product quality is good, the pricing that we'll get is good. And then we have to remember that like waste management can bring in extra money, extra resource, and um, that becomes a circular economy. We don't waste anything. So in our case, it's possible to capture waste. Unlike traditional systems, we can reclaim and valorize all the nutrients that we are losing. Whatever the fish is not eating, still we are able to take it and use it for some other purpose. And then we can use it for uh, decreasing the environmental output in uh, the following ways. Um, so dewatering the sludge, as you can see in the bottom uh, left figure, you can dewater the sludge, make it concentrated, and you can use it as fertilizer. And um, it's a very nitrogen and phosphorus rich one. Or otherwise, you can use the wastewater for uh, microalgae production, uh, which can, in, in order, uh, it can serve as feed. And then, like we have to remember that, like uh, we can convert that solid waste, the sludge that we are ga getting, into biogas, which is through anaerobic digestion, and that can be used as an energy source again in RAS. Right, that through that digester, we can take energy and we can operate a heater or something like that. So that can make the system more energy efficient if we recycle the solid waste. Otherwise, we can integrate the RS effluent with agriculture practices. Basically, aquaponics is a hybrid of uh, you know, aquaculture and RS. So, I mean, like uh, growing plants in hydroponics and then RS. So, we can mix it up easily and pre create hybrid, hybrid systems with effluents. And then, like nitrogen removal from uh, RS wastewater using denitrifying biological reactors. We have to do it before releasing it into the natural ecosystem to avoid eutrophication. So the take home message out of the whole thing is management is just as important as having the right RAS technology installed. If we have a good technology, good equipment installed, it doesn't mean that's the end of the story. Management is equally important and even more important than the technology that, I mean, the equipment's what we'll be handling. And then we have to remember that's not a easy uh, system to deal with. We have to have a 24 hours into uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week surveillance. And we should have skilled manpower to who knows to operate that system. And then when we look at the whole scenario, ultimately standard operation is not only about knowing about the fish. It's also, we have to have a very good idea about system design, how to control water quality changes. How do I have a bicycle plan? And all these things were, that we discussed in the previous um, 30 minutes or so, like those things, you have to keep in mind that like all these things are a prerequisite for us to understand before we start a RAS. And uh, with that, um, uh, thank you for your patient listening and uh, thank you for joining us for uh, today's webinar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Biju. Uh, now we will move on to the Sorry. next um, yeah, session uh, um, uh, by Dr. N.N. Pandey, sir. Uh, okay. He'll be briefing about uh, PMMSSY and uh, his experience with rainbow trout as well. So over to you, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Rajesh. Am I audible? Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Ah, so, good afternoon to everybody. This is Dr. Anand Pandey. Aap logo ne ye ek webinar training uh, program mein participate kiya. Mein sabhi ka welcome karta hun. Rainbow trout farming, jo ki Himalayan region ke liye ek bahut hi important aquaculture activity hai. और उसमें अगर हम अपना प्रोडक्शन लेवल बढ़ा बढ़ाना चाहते हैं या उसको और साइंटिफिक वे में उसका कल्चर करना चाहते हैं रेनबो ट्राउट का तो उसके लिए आरएएस सिस्टम जो एक टेक्नोलॉजी है उसके बारे में हमने दो सेशन टेक्निकल सेशन इस ट्रेनिंग में कवर किए द फर्स्ट टेक्निकल सेशन वी हैव कवर्ड फॉर द डिजाइनिंग and the setup of this unit and in the second technical session we have covered the intercultural activities in this RAS system. So government of India 
जो कि हमारे प्रधानमंत्री की ओर से एक विशेष मिशन है जो कि प्रधानमंत्री मत्स्य संपदा योजना के तहत है जिसमें कि लगभग बीस हजार करोड़ रुपए का इन्वेस्टमेंट आगामी आने वाले पांच साल के लिए किया जाएगा तो उसमें रेनबो ट्राउट फार्मिंग का एक बिग टास्क हमारे सामने है जिसको हमें अचीव करना है अपनी कंट्री के लिए अपने देश के ट्राउट प्रोडक्शन को बढ़ाने के लिए एट प्रेजेंट वी है मैट्रिक टन ट्राउट प्रोडक्शन एंड इन नेक्स्ट फाइव इयर्स वी हैव टू इंक्रीज अप टू टेन थाउजेंड मैट्रिक टन रेनबो ट्राउट प्रोडक्शन इन अवर कंट्री सो दिस इज दारगेट फिक्सड अंडर दिस प्रधानमंत्री मत्स्य संपदा योजना इस योजना के तहत हमारे जो ट्राउट गोवर्स हैं उस उनके लिए स्किल डेवलपमेंट प्रोग्राम और उसके साथ जो टेक्नोलॉजी है जो एप्लीकेबल टेक्नोलॉजी है उसका सबका इसमें प्रोविजन रखा गया है तो मैं सभी का वेलकम करता हूं कि आप इसमें पार्टिसिपेट करें और जैसे कि दिस ट्रेनिंग वॉज जस्ट वी हैव कवर्ड the all means about this rs system for rainbow trout rainbow trout farming in two technical session if you need then you can just make a direct contact to director uh, of this institute dcfr and we can provide the all technical means uh, information in english and also in hindi so this is my Uh, request to all participants and जैसे कि हमने देखा कि आर ए एस सिस्टम हिल्स में हमारे हिल्स में एक्वाकल्चर के लिए दो सिचुएशन है एक सिचुएशन है कि वी है जस्ट दी वाटर स्कार सिटी सिचुएशन एंड इन दिस सिचुएशन दिस आर ए एस सिस्टम इज ए वेरी टेक्निकल फिजिबल टेक्नोलॉजी एंड सेकेंड थिंग ये डॉक्टर राजेश ने कवर किया कि एक केजी ट्राउट को हम तीन हजार लीटर पानी यूज करके आर एस सिस्टम से प्रोड्यूस कर सकते हैं और अगर जो ट्रेडिशनल हमारा जो पहले का सिस्टम है जिसमें कि हम रेस वे में कल्चर करते हैं उसमें हमें लगभग दो लाख से तीन लाख लीटर पानी एक किलो ट्राउट प्रोडक्शन के लिए जरूरत होती है तो इस तरह से ये इस टेक्निक इस आर एस सिस्टम की टेक्निकल फिजिबिलिटी और एप्लीकेबिलिटी हमारे हिल्स स्टेट्स में है जो कि बहुत ही इम्पोर्टेंट है लेकिन इम्पोर्टेंट वी वॉन्ट आवर प्रोडक्शन लेवल एंड प्रोडक्टिविटी जैसे कि अभी डॉक्टर राजेश ने बताया कि वन क्यूबिक मीटर वाटर वॉल्यूम में एट प्रेजेंट वी आर प्रोड्यूसिंग ओनली ट्वेंटी और ट्वेंटी फाइव के जी रेनबो ड्राउट बट इफ just we want to achieve the 40 kg uh, fish from 1 cubic meter water volume or up to the 80 kg then we have necessarily we have to adopt this ras system so this is the importance of this system and the importance of the uh, this training program or the webinar uh, for just increasing the production of रेनबो ट्राउट इन अवर कंट्री सो मेरा सब लोगों से एक आह्वान है कि आप प्रधानमंत्री मत्स्य संपदा योजना में एक प्रोग्रेसिव सक्सेसफुल ट्राउट गोवर्स बन के उसमें पार्टिसिपेट करें कंट्री का जो टारगेट है टेन थाउजेंड मेट्रिक टन रेनबो ट्राउट प्रोडक्शन वो हमें अचीव करना है उस इस सब के लिए ये डायरेक्टरेट ये इंस्टीट्यूट आपको हर प्रकार की टेक्निकल सपोर्ट के लिए आपके साथ है आप आगे आए आप काम शुरू करें और आइए हम सब लोग मिलकर प्रधानमंत्री मत्स्य संपदा योजना को अधिक से अधिक सफल बनाए थैंक यू Uh, thank you dr nn pandey sir um, for uh, your uh, brief introduction on um, 
uh, actually he translated what is told in English uh, in Hindi. That was uh, good for some of the speakers wanted in, uh, some of the participants wanted in Hindi also. So he also prepared a PMS as well. Now we can, uh, we can move on to the question and answer section. Uh, people can uh, type their questions in chat box. We have received some of the questions, uh, some, some of the general questions. Questions are many. Uh, we'll try to cover uh, most of the questions and uh, some of the questions, uh, what you can do is you can also provide your email ID along with the question so that we can write back to you if you are not able to answer in this session. So we'll keep for uh, 10 minutes for the question. Um, the first question was uh, very general. Uh, is rainbow trout same as salmon fish? So the answer for this question is, uh, yeah, it, there are a lot of similarity, but there are also a lot of difference. Uh, the farming of salmon uh, has uh, various um, stages uh, compared to rainbow trout. It is not the same as, but fishes almost, uh, they belong to same family. Uh, there is a, in salmon farming, there is a process of multiplications and generally the culture periods are longer uh, in uh, salmon. Uh, preferred size is of uh, 5 kg uh, size, uh, whereas in rainbow trout, mostly 500 to 1 kgs are the most uh, preferred size for the uh, table size. And uh, another question, can we culture rohu katla in this process in the RAS? Uh, definitely, technically, you can culture it, but then the question is whether that process will be economically viable or not, because, uh, because there is a already supply of uh, uh, rohu and katla from the uh, found cultured fishes which are at sold at cheap. If you are, uh, you will be not able to compete with the uh, the fishes getting at that rate. So, I think. Uh, and uh, the question is added by in Assam because there are plenty of water is available. Whether RS should be done or not. So, if the plenty of water is available and you can do pond culture, I think it should be best way uh, for the. Um, uh, RAS will be economical only at, at present level, only economical for only high value fishes. Um, uh, second, third question, rainbow trout, can we grow in Bangalore? Uh, definitely you can grow in Bangalore. Uh, there is another project which is um, uh, already coming up in Hyderabad. They are uh, growing rainbow trout uh, in RAS in uh, Hyderabad. Uh, Bangalore definitely it can be grown. Uh, and probably the market is also nearby for the Bangalore. Uh, the third, fourth question, do we really have market in India uh, to sell the expensive fish? I think Biju can answer this question. Do, 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 you, uh, do we really have markets in uh, India to sell expensive fishes? Yeah, of course, yeah. I think uh, um, as per the present information, I think we are importing almost uh, 20 to 30 tons of salmon from uh, Nordic countries. And uh, they are being sold at 1,500 to 2,000 rupees in uh, metropolitan cities and uh, other, I mean, like uh, kind of major cities. So I think definitely there is a scope because like if we are importing kind of a frozen product and we are just paying like 1,500 rupees for it, like I think like... Um, we are, I think like in the market which is presently available also, minimum selling price is 500 rupees and it goes anywhere above that. Like, so I think that definitely there's a market for that. Okay. Um, the other question is the, how to increase uh, temperature in water. Uh, of course, uh, temperature of water can be increased by uh, various of heaters. Uh, we can use uh, gas heaters or electric heaters. They are the, um, the best way. Uh, but uh, uh, including heaters, definitely the cost of uh, production is going to high. That is one uh, one has to be considered. Uh, the third question: How to keep nitrate and nitrate in range? If uh, if they are uh, if there is a spike uh, in the nitrate and nitrate, uh, Biju can explain because he covered in his session. Yeah. Um... So basically, I think the spike in nitrate and uh, nitrate, uh, you know, like the ammonia and nitrate, what we see is mainly due to uh, kind of a poor efficiency of the bifiltration. So like if we have to see that, first of all, we have to make sure that like uh, our particulate matter is not reaching the bifilter and then like it's not clogging and just uh, hindering the work of microbes. And then we have to ensure that like we are having that consortium going well. So the bifiltration 
conditions that we are giving should be optimal there. So I think um, if you're maintaining that, like if we can really get that bifilter to work again without putting more load and allowing it to mature and then starting up the cycle, I think like we should be able to have it in the country. You can add to it. Like if, uh, yeah. Now nitrite, for example, if there is a spike in nitrite, one can add, um, you can uh, yes, salt, yeah. it immediately. You can add salt. Uh, for every ppm of nitrate, we can add um, 20 ppm of chloride ion in the form of sodium chloride. Uh, that will control the toxic effect of nitrate. It won't reduce the nitrate level, but it will reduce the to toxic effect. Yeah, same then, way we can do, do a zeolite for ammonia. Yeah. For, uh, immediate yeah, zeolite, uh, somebody is suggesting zeolite. Uh, but that's uh, not a long-term uh, option. Uh, it can be immediately we can control it. Uh, one of the major ways, as he said, the, there is a problem with the biofilter the maturation. That's or the biofiltration is not sufficient. Your system is not rightly designed for the amount of feed you put and uh, uh, the sizing of biofilter. That can be one reason uh, that you have to look in. Uh, there's another question. Oh. Yeah. Oh, it's for you, Biju. Uh, Biju, so what is the effect of activated carbon and can it be, can it decrease the ozone load from water in case we use yeah, ozone? Actually, in the process of depuration, they use activated carbon. Like the context why I mentioned was that like uh, that actually observes geospin and uh, MIB and removes right. that out. So that's the reason why they do that filtration through activated charcoal. Yeah. So for ozone, ozone, probably you can answer, yeah. Yeah, o ozone uh, can be removed. Um, basically, ozones, as I mentioned in my presentation, they are uh, they are very uh, volatile. Their uh, retention time is 15. So basically, uh, what we set is um, there is a ORP meter before ozone or the, uh, the where the ozone is injected and ORP meter where the water is comes out after the ozone treatment. So basically, um, 300 millivolt that set uh, it is set. So in this way, the ozone dosage is controlled, one thing. The second thing is when you pass the ozone through UV light, you can, uh, all the, uh, most of the ozones will be converted into oxygen. Uh, I mean, oxidized, they are reduced to oxygen. So in that way, we can control the ozone. And uh, yeah, with the ozone, one has to be very careful so that um, the people should not be exposed to ozone a lot. So ozone plant better, it is in a separate room uh, ventilated separate room uh, rather than the RS main RS building itself. So, yeah, there's another question how to eliminate uh, only bacteria from a backyard RS system. Yeah, technically, uh, if you want to reduce the bacterial load, technically, uh, UV light will be for the better for a backyard system. I suggest. Okay. Do we need to add uh, bacteria in MBBR, moving bed bioreactor? Um, we also have our MBBR. We haven't added any bacteria. What we did is uh, we did a fishless uh, cycling, uh, cycling for uh, bacteria. What we did, uh, we added ammonia and studied the ammonia and nitrite uh, uh, accumulation. Um, one can add also the bacteria uh, which is commercially available. Uh, there, there are consortium of nitrifying bacteria that are available that can also be added. And uh, I think it's not so much uh, mandatory. Uh, if you, another thing is you can slowly stock the RAS, a new RAS system, slowly stock rather than suddenly in that way, you can mature the system uh, by avoiding the spike of ammonia and nitrite. Uh, yeah. How to maintain pH uh, uh, when it goes to high or low? Uh, I think Biju can answer this. Yeah, so pH basically we uh, adjust with uh, by adding agricultural limestone and um, sodium bicarbonate, uh, soda. So these things we making sort of we add to increasing in for increasing the pH, and for decreasing the pH we add uh, hydrochloric acid. Um, so that's the way we can, uh, but then like there's a pH dosing station basically where like yes. sodium bicarbonate is given and like uh, even sensors comes along with that where like, you know, like the pH when it is automatically, when it is dropping, the pH dosing station starts working and a particular dose will go to bring the pH above 
the you know to the optimal condition so that is actually an integral yeah. part of ra systems a ph dosing station yeah. with uh, sodium bicarbonate yeah basically yeah uh, in ra system what we observe is uh, there will be a drop in ph mostly uh, unless uh, that's because of the nitrification uh, higher ph happens only in if you are using cemented tanks where there is a possibility of leaching of uh, uh, calcium carbonate from the tank system so before you stock in cemented tank you do a proper uh, you know cleaning and um, uh, that can should be done so uh, most problem you will occur is drop of ph not increase in ph will not happen generally so sodium bicarbonate addition uh, can be a best solution for uh, maintaining ph this will also help in uh, Uh, efficient function of uh, biofilter as well so the the second question uh, other question was are the components being uh, used in uh, the water explained components are used in dcfr uh, ra system yes we are uh, using the the same components what we are explained in our systems um, we have a system of um, drum filter and we have a eco trap model um, uh, solid removing dual drain tanks and mbbr uh, uh, is the k5 media and uh, uh, uv disinfection and we are also planning to put uh, ozone ozonizer uh, this year uh, do you have uh, another question was have you commercialized the, this ras system yet we have not yet commercialized uh, we will be looking for that maybe with this year okay uh, there is another question called how do you check solid removal efficiency yeah this is only possible um, if you use the swirl separators or uh, 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 radial flow settler so basically we know that the a kg of uh, a good feed uh, for example in case of rainbow trout a kg of feed uh, provides um, i mean um, only 70% of the feed is digested and rest 30% is uh, comes as a fecal so we know that when we feed 1 kg of feed how much fecal uh, fe fecal matter is come and we can siphon out the solids from the swill separators and uh, rfs and then we can weigh them drain them and weigh them and estimate the moisture in that way we can uh, calculate the solid efficiency yeah. another way of looking at it is the fecal properties like if your feces is intact yeah. like your solid removal efficiency is better if your feces exactly. uh, clarity is not good so that they call it as uh, you know fecal decantation properties Yes. So, exactly. uh, yeah. The, so that, that is also and, a way where you can see in all the systems you can see solid removal efficiency if you are studying the characteristics of your feces indirectly. Yeah. Is eco trap solid remover available for commercially for RS system of low capacity five thousand liter? Uh, it is available commercially with the entire system. Uh, but one can make also that's um, i i i feel for a small system what is the optimum temperature in a, uh, for trout and how to maintain it yeah optimum temperature um, if you want to maintain uh, it's uh, better at 14 to 16 degree centigrade and you can um, maintain them uh, like why um, the heater or chiller Uh, which are the uh, another question was can we culture shrimp in RAS? Uh, definitely, there are. Uh, uh, it can be cultured in uh, RAS, uh, but the stocking density which is achieved as of now is for uh, shrimp culture is maximum is twenty kg per meter cube. Uh, there is a um, problem with it because as I explained in the presentation, because they occupy uh, bottom surface. Uh, the shrimp production is mostly we calculate not for meter cube but for uh, square meter so it is possible okay is it feasible and economic to recommend ras to marginal farmers of rainbow trout yeah this is uh, one of the good questions uh, because definitely yes marginal farmers cannot uh, invest so much of money in uh, and take risk uh, that's why we are also working on a small scale system which uh, Uh, which has an investment like one lakh rupees or uh, or slightly more, the such uh, system should be I think should be able to be used to, useful for the marginal farmers for uh, rainbow trout production at least um, in specific regions if not everywhere. 
in specific regions where temperature profile is um, uh, available. Can we go for culture of uh, this species are in tropical region maintaining all the accessories? Uh, what, how much salinity to maintain? This is another question. Yeah, this is also RS can, the point is that the theoretically RS can be applied anywhere and even in practically, uh, irrespective of the regions, cold water or warm water. Um, what uh, salinity, salinity, once again, it depends on the what kind of fish you culture. Uh, for um, the, uh, the marine fishes, of course, you need a salinity higher, but fresh water, uh, for example, rainbow trout, so salinity, slight salinity is maintained even in fresh water to avoid as uh, nitrate toxicity, uh, nitrate toxicity uh, around, uh, that's very, very minimum of uh, 200 ppm or 0.2 ppt. Um, there are many questions. Uh, I think we can answer them through. Uh, there are some more questions. Uh, if uh, we can answer them through email, they're asking because they have provided email. So we can provide email also. Uh, there is another question. Nitrification produces hydrogen. So pH continues to reduce. Yes, that is right. Nitrification uh, uh, is an acidification process. It uh, provides hydrogen ion as well as uh, it consumes alkalinity. So over the period, you can see the drop in pH. So that's why we are adding the sodium bicarbonate in the system. Yeah, do we need to use UV light 24 into seven? Yes, uh, we need to use it continuously. Uh, the people are asking for a practical training. Uh, so we will notify uh, probably when the conditions are okay, we can also notify the fact for the practical training. Okay, then another question is, can we use a source of water? Which source of water should be used uh, for RAS? Uh, that is really a good question basically because um, the best water which we suggest uh, for the source is uh, groundwater. Why? Because uh, they generally are uh, rich in alkalinity and uh, the best source of water are not contaminated with any other microorganism um, and pathogenic microorganism. That's why uh, the groundwater is suitable for uh, RAS. Okay, there are some more questions. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Dr. Rajesh, uh, we can answer all the questions in the email, no? Yes. Uh, yeah, they can ask more questions and you can answer two mails. Isn't it? Okay, okay. So it's already time now then. So we can end the session. Um, uh, before that, I would like to thank uh, all the participants and um, for uh, attending the webinar almost for three hours continuously. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, our director who actually initiated uh, this and gave yeah. importance for... Yeah, Dr. Rajas, uh, Dr. Rajas, Dr. Rajas, before a lot of thanks, uh, I would like to say all the participants uh, that uh, this yeah. is our uh, the first attempt uh, of the whatever we had experience of our uh, RAS uh, experimentation for last you know two and a half to three years at DCFR, and uh, this attempt of you know uh, training uh, through webinar is the first time we are doing, and definitely we'd like to tell all the participants and also maybe the uh, I am not uh, really can't see who are the participants in detail. But you know, if it is some uh, state fisheries officers and farmers are attending the webinar, therefore I'd like to say that uh, we'll have a, a practical training program. I mean, the, the hand-holding training program by DCFR to all the farmers and officers uh, in the coming year in due course of time. And a special training program on 
areas will be you know formulated and uh, it will be fixed in a dcfr calendar training calendar and then you can apply uh, in the particular training accordingly uh, from the next year maybe from the month of april next uh, next month onwards next year i mean from the next april onwards batch by batch so that is one thing and uh, whatever the training has been given by dr uh, rajesh and uh, dr bizu and also dr nan pande uh, these based on the experience practical experience what we had at dcfr and uh, based on the production what we achieved i mean whatever we are discussing here today is not on the theoretical basis it is based on the uh, the production achievement whatever we have made during you know last two years and what are the difficulties and constraints we faced uh, during last two years while we maintaining the areas and while we running the areas so based on that this uh, training webinar is organized and uh, some of the activities has been you know told and discussed but definitely when you will come here and when uh, like you know the on hand training program practical training will happen and then seeing is always believing you can see it's in every parts it's in every components of the ras uh, we discuss like fall presentation to all the units so and then uh, you can have a more idea and definitely will do uh, do in the next uh, next year onwards and our you know continual endeavor will be going on and definitely i told you in the beginning that uh, also we are telling like we have we are going for two different ras model one will be for backyard ras model which uh, can marginal farmers can, by spending 1.5 to 2 lakhs can be you know set up a small ras uh, with a kind of some amount of profit as uh, sp spending less in a small area they have and also like you know that can be sold in the you know local market whatever they produce that can be sold in the local market without any difficulties so all these thing uh, we are looking into taking into account for the benefit of the marginal farmers and another unit like a where entrepreneurship model where entrepreneurs can really come forward he can take some amount of risks he have some amount of investments he can do some amount of investment and he can you know really having some expertise on this and then he can have a large more large production uh, for maybe two crops in a year and uh, that way he can have a like you know better market uh, avenues he can even uh, sold sell his product in the different market in india and uh, so all these things i mean you know post harvesting we value addition can be also done by the entrepreneurs so all these things uh, also we are taking into account and an entrepreneurship model also we are looking forward uh, at the cfr and we have developed i think next year will be you know demonstrating uh, with a practical training on both this model and also we will be linking both the technologies uh, with the pmmsy technologies because you know if you have to demonstrate the technologies that has to be linked up with industries and also has to be you know has to be you know disseminated through some you know uh, so some approach i think we look forward under true pmmsy uh, these two technologies will, will be demonstrated in the entire country and already dr rajesh uh, who is really expert in ras at our institute along with dr bizu Uh, he told like even these areas not only can be done only for uh, rainbow trout uh, even we can do for other fin fish also but uh, you know maintaining uh, rainbow trout in areas is more difficult than the fin fish if you can maintain a uh, uh, rainbow trout or a kalsa rainbow trout in areas definitely you can easily do uh, other fin fish having you know high market value so all these things will be looking taking into account and uh, will be you know doing it and well for the benefit of farmers and we encourage more large investor to come up not only farmers we even encourage large investors i mean we encourage uh, uh, big investment players should come up they should invest in areas uh, areas and producing rainbow trout so that we can have a you know big jump i mean from 1500 to uh, 10000 uh, ton we can achieve only through the system uh, diversification and you know climate resilient technology definitely areas is a you know technology which can produce more uh, in a, with a high productivity and also uh, it is a climate resilient technology we can manage the system at our will and uh, it is a fully automatized technology 
so it is what i really appreciate uh, all the participants who is uh, attending this uh, webinar almost i think uh, 312 i could see at, the, at one moment 312 participants we expect more actually today but uh, at least uh, it's not a bad figure 312 and we look forward and i really appreciate the effort made by dr rajesh and dr biju today thank you over to dr rajesh yeah now uh, thank you sir uh, you may uh, uh, i also thank uh, dr uh, debaji sharma sir for his uh, all uh, support uh, starting from uh, installation of this rs it was his idea to promote this into this level and he is always um, pushing us and encouraging us to um, do good research related to recircular aquifer system so i am thankful to you sir um i'm also thankful to ddg who is always supporting us uh, through his words and action um he has given a very good introductory uh, remarks through his experience we are also thankful to him and uh, uh, our senior dr nn pandey sir who has uh, given a brief about uh, pmssy and and about ras in uh, hindi uh, i'm also thankful to him um my colleague dr biju he has uh, covered sop which is very important part of an ra system uh it's equally important uh, one of the major because that's what we are doing it so i am thankful to him uh, for covering that uh, session um and uh, i am specially thankful to uh, dr ritesh tandel who has uh, always helping us to organize this seminar uh, has been um, almost from a 15 days he is helping us and similarly amit saxena ji is with us uh, here always helping for uh, conducting this webinar all the technicalities are uh, taken care of uh, taken care by them so we had to just concentrate on presentation thank you very much uh, ritesh and amit saxena ji and um, i'm also thankful to all uh, my colleagues here Uh, my scientist colleagues and uh, as well as um, my lab members uh, who are always supporting us for um, whatever we do um, finally i am thankful to all the participants uh, especially from the uh, from the different uh, state government um, officials from state government directors and uh, also uh, assistant director of fisheries as well as uh, professors and teachers from different uh, part of uh, the colleges as well as the students and uh, mainly entrepreneurs and farmers um i'm thankful to for attending for uh, giving an opportunity to share uh, our um, uh, experience we'll be really uh, happy to help you in any any level um, you can mail us at uh, uh, i've shared the email id uh, in the chat box you can write to us for any other questions and many of the questions we have not answered we'll try to answer all of them and uh, in any future any technical assistant will be ready to help you thank you very much so yeah we'll uh, wind up the session hmm? yeah. 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 Yeah.